Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to PyCon US 2018. Um, we will go through a three hour tutorial here about faster programs, uh, faster Python programs measured on guess. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. So, a few words about myself to warm up. So, I've been a Python user since 1999, so I can always claim the last millennium, so I'll do it for, for a while. So it's not, first, not the first time I'm doing Python training. Actually, my first Python training is also now a few years back, 2004, I remember, June 2004. I did my first Python training, and actually, uh, I do this for a living now. I'm also with Python Academy for quite a while, and I do teaching. I teach Python for, for a living for the last few years. But I'm also involved in the community, so I've chaired some Python conferences, as you can see here, your SciPy, PyCon.de, your Python, and I'm still involved in organizing Python conferences. Right now, there's two conferences that will uh, happen this year. I'm uh, intensively involved in the organization. And I'm also a chair of the Python Software Foundation, the German one, so P Python Software Verband is called. It's a kind of equivalent to the PSF, but in Germany. Okay. That's about me. Now I have a few questions about yourself. So I'm not going to throw everybody saying something. Just please raise your hand. So how many years of Python? You ha who has uh, one year or less of Python experience? Please raise your hand. Uh, about 10, 15 percent. Between one and two years? Uh, about the same. Two to five? Uh, that's the majority. More than five? It's also about 10%. So it's pretty even distribution, more or less people with different experience. So uh, I will do, do the tutorial with Python 3. Who still needs to work with Python 2? A few people. So uh, the material should still work with, uh, with Python 2. You might have to s s uh, add a, f a few from future import print statements here and there, but otherwise th the, the principles are the same. There's no big difference here. But of course, I'm using Python 3.6 for the tutorial. Uh, who of you is doing number crunching, so moving numbers and doing a lot of calculations? Uh, it's about a third or so of the people. Good. Um, and who of you has, if, if, if you have a performance problem, who's, who's more about CPU pounds or you need the, the time of, of, of running the program is a problem? A few people. And who has more like memory problems? So the memory is uh, also a few. And I.O. bound, so everything has to be reading and writing. Okay, these are the three the problems here in this tutorial. We mainly focus on CPU bound and some memory bound problems. I don't do especially CPU bound, uh, I.O. bound problems right here uh, in this tutorial, uh, but the same principles will apply. So there's no big difference there. How to do it. Good. Um, First of you, a um, short overview. This will be hands-on, so I will just give a sh short introduction here, a few, a talk a few minutes, and from then on, uh, you should work with me. So uh, if you go to the, to the website, there's a the instructions how what, what you need to install. S I, I will work with the Jupyter or the iPython notebook because it's very nice for me as a presenter, and also uh, it offers some additional tools, especially for performance measurements, so it makes it nicer. So you can do the same thing with other tools, but the notebook can be pretty interesting. That's why I use it here. Who has never used this Jupyter Notebook? Uh, so only two hands, so that should be fine. So if I question, you can also ask questions. Uh, also on the website, there's a, there's a PDF handout, so I have written everything down, and you can look at this PDF. And um, please also download the source code examples. It's very small, just a few small Python source code files. We do we we'll do some exercises. So typically, I have some exercises. We have three hours, so we have maybe been able to do all the exercises very intensively. But at least you should do something on your own. Uh, there will be a 20 minutes break, so it's three o'clock. So we should be sharp on the break because if you're not sharp, you have to stand a long line, and the snacks might be gone. So so maybe. Two minutes before three, you should think about the break. So if I forget, please remind me. Uh, it's your coffee and your snacks. And there will be feedback. So I put the link here. I also will upload it to the, to the website. So in one of the notes or should be there already. So after the tutorial, please go to this and give us our feedback. <coughs> and maybe we can improve the tutorial next time or how you liked it or not liked it. 
Okay, first of all, I will talk a little bit about a few things, and that won't take very long, and then we do something together. So, as you know, Python is a pretty high-level language, it makes a lot of things much easier, um, but it can be slow for certain types of computation. So, I wouldn't say Python is slow in general, but for certain things, and if you do things in a certain way, it might be pretty slow. This might not be a problem, so for a lot of things it's plenty fast. But if there's a problem, then um, you might think making things faster. And that's I want to give you a short introduction how to approach this, this topic. Of course, every problem is different a little bit, so I cannot give you like this uh, solution for everything, but I give you some tools to work your way through. So um, when you do optimization, you have to pay with your working time or some other things. You might make your code more complicated and add some more complexity to your code. Yeah, and this is not only the time when you edit, it's also later on you have to maintain the code. And if you have 10 lines instead of two, you have five times as much maintenance burden, so to speak. And that's a, that's a thing you have to consider if it's necessary to. Um, you always have to balance this. Fortunately, Python is a pretty fast development language, so you can do a lot of experiments very quickly. And that's what mainly the tutorial is about here. We do experiment, we measure, we do something, and then you can judge, say, if it's versus or not. No, but you do a kind of educated guess because you have some numbers you can rely on. So the first uh, guideline for optimization is just don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> premature premature uh, optimization is the root of all evil. It's not really clear who said it, so there are different sources here, Knus or Hori, but it doesn't really matter. So you should always uh, really make the case that you have a case. So do you really need it? And not only think, okay, I have to write everything in a very fast language just in case it can be slow. Uh, that might not be a problem. Um, another thing is you have to write correct code first. That's something that's tempting to start optimizing very quickly, but you have to make sure the program works correctly first before I actually s even start thinking about making it faster. And also it's sometimes tempting to optimize as you go, so to make it faster, add more lines of code, uh, which might introduce some bugs in a quote. So as I said, it often comes with a surprise. It can make your code less readable. So I, I always try to show your solutions where it makes your code more readable. In Python, it's possible to make make a code more Pythonic, more readable, and make it faster at the same time. That's not always possible. That's not always possible. So if it's if you add more code, you have more maintenance uh, effort. Readability might suffer. Yeah, yeah, and this is one of the big Python strengths that you can read your code easily, typically, mm, and that might be not as good as more. Uh, so Python's readability is just you, know, you let the com computer do the work and write less code. But if you do it the other way around, then it might not be as good. Okay, there was this optimization, so you cannot have everything at the same time. So you might decide to see I want to have a nice readable code, I want to have fast code. You might not be able to have both at the same time. So general guidelines, a few of them. Um, this is everything's common sense. And that's, that's nothing special. There's nothing, there's no really new thing here. Everything's common sense, but still it, you should go through these steps before you start doing something. Um, do you have a really case? It's really too slow. Yeah. Um, it might not be Python that's a problem. So profiling is what we do, uh, which is the core of this, of this tutorial here. It's important to find out, is this really a language as a programming language, or also some other external factors that I don't have, that are totally independent of the language. Yeah? And that like network traffic or database or something like this might slow you down. And also, does it hurt if your program is slow? So if it runs overnight, doesn't matter if it runs two hours or four hours. If you run it, start in the evening and to finish in the morning, it doesn't really matter. Two hours or maybe eight hours might be fine and you might not have a problem, so it depends. So don't optimize as you go. So you should, that's something that's sometimes tempting. Okay, I can make this faster. Uh, wait until you measure. Use realistic use cases, so who's the target audience if you just write something for yourself that you use as a tool or do you write it for somebody else or for a bigger group of people? Uh, who's the expected user, and how often the program will be used. If it's a one-time thing, maybe performance is not that important to optimize the time you spend uh, opti doing the optimization, the program is finished already. So that's something 
that might change over time. That's a problem. It is, that's in the beginning, you just write something to yourself, and then other people are going to use it, and things might change. Mm. Can happen. So external slowdowns, I mentioned already network connections, databases, call the uh, operating system functions, and so on, um, that might slow you down. And they're pretty much independent, maybe, of using Python itself, because you have to wait till somebody comes back. Architecture, so we talk a bit about the algorithms here in this tutorial, but architecture can be considered as a, like a high-level algorithm, so how you set up the whole thing, how everything works together. And this is something that cannot be answered that easily. You have just have to look at it, and maybe you find a different ways putting things together to make things faster. Um, bugs, yeah, so that can happen, that you have a bug in your program. Um, and the bug is actually the bottleneck. So if you remove the bug, everything is faster. It could, could happen. Uh, or somebody forgot to print in the inner loop or something like this. Uh, those kind of things. It's not really a bug, but it's something that can slow your program down considerably. So, and then finally, if it's really too slow, we find the bottleneck. And this is something we will do here. Often you have only a few places in your program that make it slow. If the whole program is slow all over the place, then it gets really difficult. But very often it's very common that you find some places that are slow and finding them, and then you can focus your energy in there. And it's not always clear which other places. Sometimes you have a gut feeling this is slow, but I do it for quite a while, and sometimes I'm pretty wrong with my gut feeling, and it's a different place. And the only solution is to measure, to measure and to measure. And you will see when you measure, you can also measure something in the wrong way. So. This measuring is not foolproof, and this is something we consider. If you measure something and the results are strange, try to measure it some, somehow else and to get a different answer. Yeah, Always check the results of the opt optimization, so you should have some tests in place, whatever you use, um, that you, when you change something, you still have the same results. That's important. And tests should be automatic tests, not only looking at it, just uh, have some automatic tests that run and you see if everything is still the same. So typically, the most performance can be gained by changing the algorithms. So fortunately, when you use Python, you have built-in data structures that, have that come with their own algorithms. And if you use the right data structure, then you use also different algorithms potentially for something. And that can make your program potentially much faster. So if you can change the algorithm, you find a smarter algorithm, then things can be much, much, much faster. And finally, sometimes it might be easy if you kind of find a better solution, just uh, buying a few more gigs of RAM or something like this. So getting the processor faster, does not you don't get it 10 times as fast. It kind of does not so much money. You can just, there's no professor ac uh, processor actually is 10 times faster. But you can buy, for instance, more RAM, and RAM make can make things potentially much faster. Uh, nowadays, a lot of databases just run in RAM uh, because it makes things much faster. There can be solution. It might be the most inexpensive solution if you compare the time you spend on uh, your program compared to the time you spend on buying some more memory. OK, this is all the, all the talk, all the presentation I have. The rest will be now interactive work. So you're welcome to work along with me. Just ha let's have a short look. This is a handout here, um, uh, what we, we will talk about. So. This is just also optimization guidelines I just talked about. First, the first section is strate strategy, how to measure things, how to do timings. So we'll do different types of timings here. And um, I will show you a few things what you can do with timing. And we, s we spend some time on profiling CPU usage, usage, which is very common, how to find out where, where the time goes when you run something. And we also look on, on some tools to visualize these things. And the second part of this strategy uh, section here is profiling memory usage. Uh, and I'll show you a tool to profile memory usage. And then in the next part, we look at some algorithms, some um, things you should do or you can do in Python or not. These are just examples. So I cannot show you everything. It depends very much on your use case. But it gives you some example where what to look for, where, where there might be some, some problems. And then we look at uh, the right data structure. We compare different data structures, and these are more use cases for comparing how, things, how fast things are. We can use some of the tools we learned before to compare things here, and we look at this big O notation. And finally, we also have a caching se section, which is one 
with those tools to make things faster. In the end, I just give you a short overview of maybe some other further methods to speed up and extend Python in different ways. So that's what we're going to look here. So we will measure quite a bit. And this is my main message, actually, that you need to measure. So you have to quantitize things. You have to make it give, give it some numbers, how long it takes, how much memory it takes, and so on, to actually see also that when you change something, improve something, things get faster. And you see, oh, it's the effect of x faster. Good. OK. Um, let's get started. So I created a new directory here. And I'm going to start a Jupyter Notebook. So I use Jupyter Notebook. I'll make it a bit bigger. bigger. You can see it better. So here's Jupyter Notebook. And we will spend most of our time in Jupyter Notebooks. A few things run through scripts. So, but Jupyter Notebook is great because uh, it is a very good teaching tool. And also, I will upload my not notebook. Everything that I develop here in the course, I might, if you have some questions. So add some more material we don't have in the handout or anywhere else. And therefore, uh, you will get the notebook. So I make a new notebook, a Python 3 notebook, of course. And then we I give it a name. Strategy. So, and I just, um, so you have to rename your notebook. And I just turn off the header so you get more space and make this thing a bit faster, a bit bigger. Good. So everybody got a notebook running. So I typed on, on, the, on the command line Jupyter Notebook. So I can show this, this command to you here uh, that I use Jupyter Notebook. And if I have everything installed, it should start a new notebook server in your browser. And then just click on New, make a new notebook. So I work everything here is Python 3. If you still have Python 2, it still still work here. Good. So um, I measured. I downloaded a few things. So if if you go to the source directory, so the the zip file in the source directory, and you go to measuring, measuring. No, source. There's another directory. It's called. Uh, Optimization, I think, yeah. See the optimization subdirectory and then measuring. And then I have a few files in there that, um, that give you some ways, that's some examples here. Some th th most of them are very small. So I try to always to, to find the smallest example that still makes the case, but there's not too much uh, fluff in there. So to tr I try to make them pretty sh short. Okay. Um, first thing is what I would like to show you is this concept of PyStone. So there's a there's a, a, a kind of a performance measurement here, which is called the PyStone. And you can either run this PyStone from here, or we can also run it from the command line. Let's quickly go to the command line for now. And I make a new Py36. So I work with uh, what's called Conda environments. That's why I have to activate it, you don't have to do this. And then I go to the source uh, optimization measurement subdirectory, and then you see a few of these uh, scripts here. And some of them are called PyStone. And there are different versions for two and three, and uh, two and three. So you can run them. So I will just now run them for, for two. And uh, you can do this. And this is a it comes with Python. It's a script I didn't develop myself, but it comes with Python. And it gives you a, a kind of a measurement how fast your computer is and how many PyStones you have. So this is one version of Python that runs this PyStones. And you can have, or you can also have this 2.3 version, which works with both of them, because there are slight differences. And you might get some other measurement, for example. So now. For change, I do the same thing. I run it with PyPy. So you might not have PyPy installed, but just as an example, I do the same thing, and I run it with PyPy. This is a, uh, it's a different Python implementation, and I get a quite a bit of different reading. You see now here, this is about one and a half million PyStones, where here I have only uh, 164,000 PyStones, so it's nearly a factor of 10 different. So for this specific benchmark, PyPy is 10 times faster. 
It doesn't mean pi, pi, pi is always 10 times faster. So when you measure something, you always have to say for this benchmark. And of course, you can always tune benchmarks the way you want yeah? <laughs> to make to prove your point if you want. But this is kind of a mixture that comes with Python. And you can see if you're just using PyPy, uh, PyPy is a new Python implementation, or different Python implementation that is 100% Python. Uh, it is this is still the Python 2 version here, but they, they also have a Python 3.5 compliant version. Uh, and then you should be able to run any pure Python program, and even nowadays, quite a few extensions that are written in C, and it, everything will be fast, just as an example. So this is something benchmarking. It does different benchmarks to measure. In this case, we measure how fast Python is itself, and you can can do something like this. Good. This would be benchmarking. Uh, so the, the first chapter benchmarking. Now I would like to go to timing. So the different ways of doing timing measurements, there's a module called Time It in Python Standard Library. Who of you used the module Time It before? A few people. So the module Time It is interesting, but when you're in the Jupyter Notebook, actually there's a nicer use interface for Time It. They use the module Time It, but you don't have to actually import it, make instance of something, and or run a function and provide your source code as a string. You can use um, Time It directly from from here. There's different different uh, two different ways. So I could say import Time It. This is a, a standard library module in Python. And in time it, you can, for instance, say I have A is 1 and B is 2. Yeah, And then I can say time it, module name, dot time it. And I can provide the source code now as string A plus B. And if you do this, it tells me it cannot find A and B, no such name. So you have to actually give it the uh, namespace, and then you can say the globals, globals name uh, is locals or globals, which is the same here in, in my case. Yeah. So I provide this one, and now it takes my namespace and finds A and B. So it's such in the namespace I provide. So locals is a dictionary that gives me the namespace, which is a pretty long dictionary here because I'm in the notebook, but A and B will be contained. So you can check A in locals will give you true because it's just a dictionary and inside this dictionary you have a key A and the key A uh, gives you the value 1. And now A plus B, this measure takes 0 0.6 seconds. It's very slow here because there's quite a bit overhead for something to doing something. If you rerun it, you might get a bit different, yeah, slightly different result. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, but you see, you have to assemble the source as a string and then you have to give the namespace. If you're in the notebook, you, use, you can use time it, which is a so-called magic command. So the notebook has this, or actually comes from my Python, has this magic commands, all the things that start with a percent sign here. And now you can say one uh, A plus B, and this one will take A plus B from this namespace, and it takes a bit longer because it's not only running it once, it's running it many times. So typically it tries to run it more, more or less at it repeats it many times, the loops, that it takes about one second, and does this for seven consecutive runs, for seven runs, and then gives you statistics. Yeah, So it takes this runs and then tells you, okay, A plus B takes here 70 nanoseconds, and it gives you the standard deviation, for instance. That's what this time it is doing, and you can um, do quite sophisticated things. If you look at time it, help, just if you put a question mark, you get a help, and you see it takes quite a few options. So we haven't specified anything, so it took the defaults, but you can specify quite a few things. Pretty much everything you can this time it also. You see um, this n, so how many how many times it should execute. So if you don't want this 10 million or whatever it is here, I can specify it. Also the repeat, which here says it's 3, which is not true because it's 7. <laughs> so this obviously the help is not updated yet, I guess. Um, and a few other things. So you can produce some output files in different ways. You can make it quiet without any output. You can also have a, which is interesting, minus O, you can have a time and result object. So we will use this later. So if you want to, you can do this and you can say dash O. And then you can have this result. And you can also say quiet Q. And then 
it doesn't give you any output, but you once it's run, it always takes a little bit. You have to be patient here. And then you have a result object, and this result object has all kinds of interesting information. For instance, you have the average. So this is this average, which is about this this number. It's a bit different now. It's not 70 nanoseconds, but 54 nanoseconds. So if you repeat this run, I might get slightly different numbers. So that's one thing. So if you repeat your measurements, you might you could always get a different number. How how much different depends. So now it's 50 nanoseconds. Of course, kind of find something faster for some reason. You see, and this is about the average value, but you can also f find um, the timings itself, so you can find all values. Yeah, These are all values, and they, they look all very, very similar. There are no big differences. That's, that's fine. Yeah. So if you want to look at them. And also, of course, you have also have the standard deviation and all this kind of stuff. It's in here. This is where it's printed out. Very small, which is fine in this case. So that's interesting. You can save these results and see it has more information here if you want the com number of loops, the best, and so on. Uh, there used to be a, back to a, a few versions back of the notebook that only three runs and use the best result. Now they switch to the average. There are different opinions. Yeah. So if some people say it can be faster and faster and we take the best result because there was something going on. But now they switch to the average because it could be some caching effects. You know, processors have a cache, and um, if things are warmed up in the cache, things might be much faster than if it's not. So there might be some strange effects, uh, and therefore, if you run it multiple times, it might be better. This is an opinion, and some people might have other opinions how to do this, uh, but you can always look at all the timings if you want. Yeah. So if things are strange, you might look a little bit deeper and look in the um, inside uh, these measurements. Good. So interesting tool, one of these magic functions, and then Jupyter Notebook has a lot of them, um, that can help you to go sometimes way beyond what Python can do. We have a lot of other things, we will use some of them here and there. Okay, this is some timing, we will use this timing examples, and I will use it in different combinations in different ways. So this should give you some feeling what you can do with it. Uh, the next topic is profiling. Profiling CPU usage. So, this is typically when you talk about uh, optimization, most of the time you want to have things faster. So, and the very first step when you, when you look at your program, you have to investigate, and profiling is a tool to do this. Fortunately, Python comes with uh, some profiling tools that are under standard library. The first, I will show you this tools in the standard library, how they work, and of course, since we the notebook, the notebook offers you a nice interface to profiling, and you can do the same thing from the notebook, but sometimes you want to use the built-in Python once when you want to use it in the script and not in the notebook. Yeah. The notebook is a very nice tool, but it's not a tool for everything. So it's always use the right tool for the right job. If you want to interactive work, it's very likely that the notebook is the right thing. If you want to do some things that are more automatic, then a notebook might not be the right thing to run the right script or some other kind of use some other kind of tool. Good. Um, I make it a little bit smaller, otherwise it's jumping back and forth here because when it saves it prints some text and it changes the <laughs> display here. Okay. Uh, I have a few of these um, in this measurement directory. You see there's a quite a few of these helpers. And I just I can load those file, those files here. And the first one is profile me. So profile me. And this is a very, very simple program. As I said, I try to make very, very simple programs that is very they are very easy to understand. You see, I still have them poor man's uh, Python 2 support here. Um, and I have just two functions. One is called fast and one is called slow. So I use a time library from the standard library from Python. And this has a function sleep, which stops execution of your program. And this actually tells the operating system, uh, I want to sleep now, please wake me up in so many seconds. So it doesn't use CPU. And this is important, we will see. There's a difference between uh, wall clock time and, and uh, CPU time. So far, we always talk about wall clock time. This is a time that really elapses from point A to point B in time. And then I have a slow one, which is waiting a tenth of a second versus a thousandth of a second. So there's two orders of magnitude difference here. And they don't do anything useful, but they just f use wait for time. And this is, this is important, make some very easy use cases you understand 
or you think you understand <laughs> what it's doing, and then measure and see if the measurements agree with what, what you measure, actually, or what, what, what you think. So, so right, that's a measurement and your, your, your picture of what's actually happening agree. If they don't agree, then there's something wrong already. But if it's very simple, it's, it's much easier that you find the problem if it doesn't agree, then you have a complex program. So then you don't know, is this my program, or just to have a wrong understanding what I actually measure. No, so sometimes you might go st st step back and make a very simplified version of your program that you understand, but still captures the main essence, and then you can measure it. So of course, it's different for every use case. And y if you strip away too much, then you don't have a case anymore. If you have to keep it too complex, then it's difficult to understand potentially. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now this is our my, my simple program, and you see I have one that is just using a loop hundred times calling fast and using a loop hundred times uh, going. Slow and if now if I execute the cell, it takes about 10 seconds because if I do 100 loops with 0.1 second, um, it should be about um, one second. Okay, now let's do it the slow and painful way with only the standard library in Python, and for the for this use case, you interactively, but can still be useful. And then we do it in the fast way with a with a notebook. So we import. Uh, what's called C profile. There are different profilers in Python, and you always want to use C profile. So profiling always introduces overhead, and you typically want to have the overhead small, so to make your measurement faster, but also maybe potential influences of your measurement into the into your measurement uh, into your program. So when you measure something, you always influence the system. You always change the system. It's just a question of how much. If it's half a percent, it should be fine. If it's fifty percent. Or 200 percent, yeah, so the measurement is more important than the thing that you measure. That can happen. We'll see this, and then you have to find some other way of doing it. The problem is, you don't know actually because you you would only know if you could measure it exactly. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit complicated. But there are some kind of proxies that they can give you some hints that the measurement is pretty strong compared to what the measure. So if you the measure time is very short, typically we'll see the shorter the time, the more difficult it is. If something takes very long, it's pretty easy because uh, if it's something takes a minute, then the percent of a minute is is fine. If it takes a something takes a millionth of a second, then a percent, a few percent, so it's still a very short time. Okay, now so we have this uh, this module C profile. So as you might see here, uh, for some reason, the capital P is there. So typically, if you go with PEP8, uh, Python module names should be all lowercase. It's not here. I'm not sure why it's not. Re of course, in Python 3, those names, those module names, have been renamed. At least some of them. This one has not been renamed. I don't know why. So, if it would be consistent, it should be renamed, in my opinion. But uh, there might be some re reasons. But I don't know. Okay, I make an instance of a class. So as I say, module C profile dot profiler, and now I have this instance, which will be my profiler here. So. We will see you can work with one instance. You can also have multiple instances to work with. And now there are different ways how you can actually run your code. So I can say profile, which is uh, here the instance of profiler instance of my class. And I can say something like run call. So when I run call, I just use um, the function I use fast, sorry, use fast, the function, and then I could have here the arguments. Since uh, this case I can skip this one. If you have a function with arguments, you can supply a tuple with arguments. So here I don't have one, I can skip it, but it shouldn't work, it shouldn't, uh, uh, it doesn't take, because it doesn't take arguments, so it doesn't want it here. Okay, um, so I do this, and it's doing something, it doesn't show any results, and now you can look at the results. So I can say profiler, and can ask uh, for the profile, uh, for the results. Profiler, which is the instance of my class, and then I can say print stats, and this print stats has a lot of options. So again, when you need a notebook, use a question mark to see the help, and you see you can sort it. Actually, not so many options. There's a different function that has many options, but uh, you can print stats, and then you get here statistics. I make it a bit smaller. Let's make it a bit easier to read. So you get statistics. And you see now um, there are different columns with different meanings, the number of calls per function, the total time, the cumulative time. So the total time is the function time spent in the function overall. Cumulative time is the time spent in the function plus the time to spend in the sub-functions, function calls. So there's a small difference here. And you see um, 
this is not very nice because it's zero because it's so fast you don't see anything. So it's because it only shows three digits here. But you get some feelings. If it's a very small program, that's why I only have a few few lines. If you have a real program, you have potentially hundreds and hundreds of lines here. So C profile or in this case, works only in a function level. So the smallest unit you can look at is a function. So if you want to measure something, you might need to put it in the extra function if you want to measure some uh, uh, action on itself. We will see later on there's also a way to do line-by-line -line profiling, which uh, comes with a quick bit overhead in Python. So now you get this output, and you can see easily where the time goes here, that you have here uh, uh, the time spent nearly all in this uh, in the sleep method, that's where the time goes. Yeah? So most of the time is spent in the sleep method. So and if you make a second profiler, second profiler, and I do the same thing again, and I say profiler2 dot run call, and then I say use slow, that takes a while. Yeah? So it takes 10 seconds because now it has to run this function, and as up here because it waits for it lasts for 10 seconds. And once it's done, you can do the same thing. You can say profiler2 dot print stats, and you can get the output. And you see now uh, the time is about 10 seconds plus something. Yeah. So this is mainly this 10 seconds that it just waits, and you can see that everything goes into this built-in time sleep method. So here's very clear that time sleep is, we know this. So, but as I said, Take something that you know, measure and see if your measurement agrees, and here it agrees, obviously, uh, that this are slow. And as you can see here, this thing measures profiler, so it measures itself. That's like this example, if you count how many people in a room, you count yourself. And so it's th th this, this thing, this measurement is in here itself and measures itself, because you cannot take it away somehow. So it's at least it shows it here, and of course it's everything zero because it's so fast. And then you have this... Uh, and also here, this, uh, no, no, it's not here, the other measurements, do you see this uh, execution of the, of the notebook times? Okay, there are different ways of running these things, and you can also uh, store the results. And uh, in fact, that's m very often what you want to do, especially if you use this interface, that you don't look at the results immediately, but you have more than one result and you want to store something in a file, uh, or you want to run something overnight and you want to store the result in a file, then the next day look at those things, for instance. And uh, I have an example here. So we can, for instance, say, without making an instance, see profile, uh, get another way, run. And now um, we can supply the function as, um, as a string, use, fast and call it uh, like this and then we can store the results in so called stats file yeah and this we run it and as as you can see now uh, there is a file with extension stats and this if you look inside this binary it's i think it's marshall so they, they use some serialization format to store the results, but it's standardized, and there are a lot of other tools that can read these files. In fact, that's what we're going to do with our snake vis visualizer. We read one of these files, uh, and we can visualize the results. So that's important, so you can have measurements, especially if you want to compare different measurements. You just have to name the files accordingly, and you can have a lot of different measurements in these files, and then you can compare them. And there are tools, actually, that do this. And one to very simple tool that comes with Python, actually. So import um, pstats, and this pstats has uh, some functions, actually, to sort it. So it you can make a stats extension uh, uh, instance here, and you say uh, pstats dot stats, and give it a file name. Yeah, this is our file name, and now it reads it, and now this is an instance of whatever we did. So this can be done later, it doesn't have to be in the same program, because you stored everything in the file, and now you can work on this file, and you can do something. So I can say stats, stats dot print, 
and now this print gives you a lot of inf the different prints and if our print starts it prints a standard way so it's pretty much the same thing we had before only since we now we um, yeah this is pretty much the same thing we had before when you see the output here of this 204 function calls we have um, when we use this uh, this function and you see again the time goes into sleep here oh, one at a time or the display and then you have this and then yeah this one offers a lot of different options so you can also sort it and and so on there's a lot of different display options for instance you can say sort stats and you can uh, stats and you can sort it by for instance instead of uh, the time you can store sort it by number of calls calls yeah the column is called n call but i um sort it first and then I say print stats and I can also limit how many I want to display if I just say two it prints only two lines yeah and if I say four it prints four lines for instance and you can see now it's the, the two functions are called hundred times are first and then the other ones so there are many many options where you can sort these results and you can produce some kind of uh, okay looking output here and you can have information for instance you can f find out who's calling whom so you can say print callies and print call print uh, callers so it's who's um, calling who and you see this arrows indicate which function is calling which and you can say stats dot print callies and then you get it the other way around yeah so this can be interesting uh, and you can get a maybe feeling wha what's going on in your program. Here's very simple, though there shouldn't be a big thing. Okay, this is a way to do it with the Python standard library. But since we're in a notebook, we have a more, more comfortable way here. We just can say prun, prun, it's a command. And then we say use fast. And we call it just the way we want. And there's no string we still apply here. So, and you see now we have the same output, and we get this information here. So the first thing, if you don't know how this P run works, you use a question mark in it, and that will show you all the options that it offers. And it can be pretty interesting, because it offers quite a few options. So. Those magic commands always come in two flavors. You have the one line flavor that says 1% sign, and you can also have one, one expression there. The other one is the one with the 2% signs, and you have write it on top, and then you can write as many statements as you like in your file. And then it will execute the whole cell. And typically in the beginning you have options or some, uh, we will see some setup code or something. The, the first line is special, and then you have to write the code, where here you have the statement right here. And here you have this uh, p run for one line. Yeah. So there are two different options, but the uh, two different ways to use it. But the options are the same. And see, I can now say use fast, and I can have an option like limit the output to two, and you get yeah lowercase l l two, and you get only. Oops. Why doesn't show anything? Oh yeah. I closed it in the same time or something. There must be an effect. Okay, now I limit the output to two, and you can see now I have only two lines of output. That's one of these options you can have, and they look just like command line options, but um, And they, they allow you to customize the display. So the limit is something you can do. Uh, you can also have an R option, which cre creates one of these this instance of the stats object we just seen. So we can create still create this object if you like, and you can work with it. Um, you can also sort. You can have multiple sort criteria. So you can say p run sort by something s. Uh, and then you can have this column names uh, calls use fast, for instance. And this would sort by uh, class calls. Yeah, And then it would sort by calls. You can also sort by, s by something else in the second 
and so on. So you can have multiple sort criteria, and so on. You can also save the result uh, in, in a in a stats file, the so same thing, and you can also save the print out the results of everything that's in this box here in a text file. So these are more options to save, and typically this is easier to use because you don't have to have import, make instance, and work with it, so it's faster and more convenient as long as you work interactively with a notebook. Good. These are the basic things for timing, so you can look at a function level and to see what's going on. Now, a very important thing, we have to distinguish uh, wall clock time wall clock time and CPU time. This is important. So, so far we always measured uh, wall clock time, not CPU time. When I have um, a script um, which is called clock check, which is doing some very simple measurements for different types of timings. So I have several modules here imported, you see, OS, Sys, Time, and Time It, and I do some checks. And here, this is a core. Here I repeat a million times one plus one, and I also, also sleep for a second. So this is some, this one uses CPU. Sleep for a second, as I said, is kind of input-output, because I tell the operating system, please wake me up after so many seconds. Um, and then there's no CPU usage here. And I have three different ways of measuring the time. So I use OS time, times, which gives me a tuple of time, timings, and I take the first entry, which is a timestamp, and I do the same thing afterwards and calculate the difference. The next one is clock, and then the next one is default timer. So it's three different beginning timestamps and three calculations. Here's actually the, the outer one measures the, the inner one, but it doesn't really matter too much because what I'm doing here is much takes much more time and I wait much, much longer, so that this little mistake here is not a problem. And then I print it out. And when I do this, since I'm a, on a Mac, it's a BSD, Unix system, I get this measurements. And you can see the default timer measures the uh, uh, wall clock time because it takes a second and a little bit. And the other two measures the CPU time, where this waiting for a second doesn't count. Uh, by the way, you have to be careful when you use time sleep. Time sleep is not very accurate, especially in Windows. So if you do a million times a millions of a second, you typically don't get a second. Not necessarily. It can be pretty off. It can be like two seconds or so. And I think Windows is even, even less accurate. Yeah. So time sleep is something that's, wait half a second, that's fine. So it doesn't really matter if it's half a second in a few more milliseconds. Um, or microseconds more, but if you want to have very short ones, sleep is not the way to go. But here it's good enough because we wait for a second. And you see this Unix system. If anybody has Windows, if you want this in Windows, we see different numbers. And this is important because time clock means something different in Windows than Unix. It has traditional reasons. So if you do something and you have to work with different operating for some reason, you have to be very careful what timing you use. Make sure you use the right timing. So the typical thing when you when to measure time differences, use time at default timer. Time at default timer will point to different timers depending on the operating system and use the right one. So for the default timer, we are, we are not interested in the absolute value, we are always interested in the difference. So we have a timestamp and you see the absolute number of windows will to look totally different than mine, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So we have to be careful because time clock in doesn't mean uh, this, uh, there's a CPU time is more work time in uni Windows. So, so make sure you use the right timing measurement. Otherwise, you might spend half a day measuring something just to realize, ah, I'm used the wrong timing method. That's why it does nev nothing makes sense. Uh, just common mistake, sounds easy, but those things, mm, it's like adding, uh, you're working, on it, it, the changes don't have any effect until you realize you added the wrong file. It's the same name in a different directory. It's kind of similar thing. But those simple things, you just have to be aware, and then it's much easier to... Risk. Okay, so if um, I have a small, not import load, it's fine, small helper, that's... Um, what's the name of this? Um, CPU time. Yeah, CPU time. Uh, and here I have this... Um, I write a small own functions as an example, depending on the platform, I use a different version, a different function to actually calculate uh, CPU time. So in Windows, I use OS time 
zero, uh, and then Unix I use time clock. Yeah, because time clock is not CPU time on Windows, but uh, OS times is not very accurate. So, but having something that's not very accurate maybe, but doesn't have something something that's totally wrong. Yeah? So I write the own function, and um, again I have to two functions here, one slips for two seconds, the other one does 10 million, 100 million times here, one plus one, so use up CPU, this really uses CPU, and then I have my test function that uses both of these functions, and then I use uh, profiling, and as you can see here, this is what we did before, I make an instance to do the profiling, as optionally, I can also specify a timing function. Per default, it takes it measures wall clock time, but you can also specify a different function as you do here. And this one now measures CPU time. And now you see there's a difference here. The main difference is when I measure wall clock time, I have about five seconds. Yeah, because I have this this sleep function. Where do I call sleep? Uh, yeah, of course I sleep two seconds twice here. That twice, yeah, the sleep. Where's the sleep? Sleep, sleep, sleep. Yeah, there's two seconds for the sleep, and the rest is something else. And here's is only three seconds because the two seconds are missing. So there's there's no sleep. This is here a very small number compared to. So just look at the two seconds and see pretty much zero. Because now I have only the CPU time, which is slower than the war clock time. So most of the time for normal Python, CPU time is is less than war clock time. But it doesn't have to be. If you have more than one core, and you actually can use more than one core, then CPU time can be higher than work clock time because CPU time is too big accounted pro CPU. So theoretically, you could have with four cores, uh, CPU time four times as big as work clock time, which is not really possible, but three point something is possible. With Python, it's easy because you have the guild, so having CPU pound things in parallel, it's not possible with pure Python, but still, there are some modules that use. C extensions or other means to, to make it to make it work, but in our case here, we, we don't look at this in this tutorial. But there are ways actually to get it parallel if you use some some libraries, some other helpers. Pure Python itself cannot run CPU pound things in parallel in one process. Good. Um, this is our small helper function that makes it here a bit interesting. Okay, let's look at a little bit more complex function. And this is my standard example. Oh. Uh. Uh. Okay, so example. I have example function. This is uh, maybe the most um, inefficient way to calculate pi, you know, the pi from the circle. Um, and uh, But I use it here because I think I have to change directory. Yeah. So d there's this. Um, in the pi directory, there's uh, there are several functions here, and one is the simple pi, and this is a function to calculate pi. So it's Monte Carlo. So there's a little bit geometry. So you you have. Um, I don't have anything to draw here. Sorry. Typically, I, I draw the, the, at the board. There's nothing to draw. But um, you have a circle, and um, you have a circle with a diameter, and you have a square that's that's around a quarter of the circle. And then you do can do some uh, mathematics. You can calculate this this the area of the um, square, which is. Um, radius times radius, you know, because it's a square, and then you can calculate pr squared, which is um, the area of the circle, and then take divided by four, which is the quarter of the circle, and then you put this more relationship and transfer it, uh, uh, convert it to pi, and then you come up that pi is four times the area of the circle divided by the area of the square. So now the problem is we don't know the area of the circle because it needs pi, which is kind of recursive. But now instead of actually taking the area, we take uh, throws of arrows. We throw all the arrows on the square. We know the number of arrows in the square, and some of them hit in the circle randomly. And if you throw an unlimited number of arrows, then you get an approximation, or you get an a proxy for the area. So of course there is no such thing like 
uh, unlimited number of, of, of throws. Therefore, this can be only approximation of this one. So, making a long story short, I have some mathematics here which is doing exactly this. So, x and y are the coordinates of my uh, arrows that hit somewhere. And I use Python's random random function to calculate a random number between 0 and 1. And then I use Pythagoras to calculate the the distance, and if this is less than one, I'm inside the circle. If not, if not, then not. So, you might not have understood the mathematics, but it doesn't really matter. It's a simple mathematical problem that produces a number that looks something like pi. You see, I do a million iterations here. That's a million iterations to get like two two digits here after the period. Yeah. So it's not very accurate, and you typically have to have to run very very high. Um, um, iterations, number of iterations to get somewhere. Uh, the thing is, this is, since it's, uh, you have used random numbers, this is a very nice example to make it faster because you can parallelize, you can do all kinds of things with it, that's why I use it here. And you use a little bit mathematics so something is going on and it is our example for our runtime. Okay, and now we can actually um, look at this function and you can see what's going on. And we can do this with uh, p run, and you can say just p run, and you run our uh, pi plane function here, yeah, with our million runs, and then you can see uh, what's going on, and you can see where the time goes, and you can see the number of calls to random. Yeah, if I have a million here, then random is called two million times because it's called twice in the loop. And you can see where the time goes that this random takes uh, quite a bit of time here. And the second function is the square root function, which if you look exactly, it's, it's actually not necessary because we have random numbers between zero and one, so you could actually skip the square root, but I kept it in to um, do some computations. And you see it takes the second uh, most time here. And then the other one uh, don't take so much time for total time, if you look at the total time, because it's a cumulative time which contains the rest, but these two actually are where, where the time goes in this example here. And the, other little th the rest goes into the function itself. Okay, now you can look at the table, and you can work with the table, and you can do something with the table, but you can also use a tool that makes this easier. So this is still a very simple example. If your program gets bigger, the table can get longer. It takes you a while to make your way through the table. That's why th you can use a tool to visualize it. And actually, I, I use a tool called SnakeWiz to visualize the output, and you can see where the program goes. Uh, first, we use it from the command line. You can also use it from the notebook, of course, as everything. But uh, you can run it from the command line. And I'll show you a few ways how you can do this. So I go to the Py directory. And first of all, I need to create one of the starts files. And there are different ways of doing it. So I can actually run uh, the module C profile as a standalone program by using the M switch. So if you are in Python M, then you give it a module name and then runs it as a, as a standalone pro uh, program. So C profile, and then I can specify the output file should be pi dot stats. Start or stats, doesn't really matter. And then I run the program that should produce this output file. So it runs it and produces my output because print is a side effect. You see the print. And then uh, um, we see the r result of this running in this file. And now you can visualize uh, what's in there by using SnakeWiz. SnakeWiz as a program here and use this file. Why doesn't it work? But I just checked that. Ah, yeah, I, I haven't activated my environment, which, of course, I cannot, doesn't work. And when I do this, then it opens, no, it runs it and opens a local uh, server here and then shows you the result here in, in visualization. So that's the visualization. 
here. And this one, now there are different ways. Th this is a sunburst visualization. There's other visualization called icicle, which shows you exactly the same information, but in a different way. So this is rectangles, and this is circles. So the sunburst means this is the start of my function. So this most inner circle is always 100% because that's where everything started. So this is 100% at runtime. And going more out, this is all the next functions I'm calling the next function, I'm calling next function, I'm calling. Yeah, you see, this is built in exec. This is actually to execute a function. It's measured here, and this is the next one. This is the module level here, and this is now the function uh, test, and this is a function pipeline that we're interested in. You see, now it highlights two things. So this is a, the time to actually spend at the function itself, and this is the time that's spent in the sub-functions, and you can just go over it and you see this is a sub-function random random, and this is a function um, square root. So it's the same thing we saw on the table. And by the way, you have the table available, all the information on the table is here, with a nice side effect that you can sort the columns without typing a new command, you just have this kind of more convenient way to sort by all these criteria, and you still have this. You see, this has gives you a lot of external whatever measurement stuff in here. So if I'm only interested in this function, I can just click on it, and now it makes this function 100% and you can see the rest. This is our simple pi, the rest we I don't want to see, and you can see the rest. And you can, of course, if you want to, you can change to icicle, that makes it nice and make it easier. This is a pi plane function, and then this is what is spent in the function itself, and that's spent in the sub-functions. Because again, it can only, can only break down the time that's uh, on a function level, not deeper. Good. That's very useful. So you can use snake with to visualize it. And you can also have some uh, tweaking here, because if you have uh, really thousands of functions, then you of course you cannot display thousands of functions and pictures. Typically, you're interested in the ones that take most of the time. All those little guys that take a little bit of time, they're not very interesting most of the time. And then you can also have the depths and all some other criteria to have it. And you can also get the call stack, so a bunch of extra information here that can be can be useful. Yeah, you have the table. You can see uh, the numbers if you want to have the numbers, not only the visual thing. Good. This is SnakeWiz, so a very interesting tool that can help you to make the other results easier to interpret. It, interpret. Of course, you can also use SnakeWiz from the notebook to do this. Uh, SnakeWiz comes with an extension for the notebook. So when you install SnakeWiz, it installs an extension, and you have to uh, Snake Wiz. You have to load this extension first. And once you load this extension, then you can use it. And see now, I can even tap completion, and you can do SnakeWiz, and you can use the same commands, and you can call your function. So I can now call simple. Uh, do I have to import it? Yeah, I could call p plane, pipeline, pipeline directly. Yeah, with a million runs, and then it opens in the second tab, and you see the same information. There's a little bit less uh, noise here because I call the function directly. Don't have the module and all this kinds of stuff around it. But this is essentially the same information. If you look at this, is our square root function, our uh, random function, and uh, the calls are a bit different because you have less circles. But this is what I mean. I call the function directly here, and it opens in the second tab. So that's pretty convenient. So you don't have to do it from the command line. You can do it from the notebook. Good. This is C profile with some tools from the Sound Library and SnakeWiz to visualize it. Everything here is on the function level. So if you want to look deeper, you have to you potentially could rewrite your code to put more code into functions to see it. But there's also a tool, uh, a tool for line profiling. So you can do line profiling and you can measure performance line by line. This is interesting. It has a big drawback. It makes your code very slow. So typically you cannot use it in a whole full program because it would, for most cases, make it so slow that's not usable. So typically you would go with C profile first. 
And if you're satisfied, it's fine. But if not, and you find one function or two functions that you want to investigate more, then you can do line profiling from these functions. Yeah, so you zoom in and say, okay, uh, I want to do this. Uh, I want to do line, uh, line by line function. So to do this, you have to install line profiler. And then you can go line by line. Line by line. Uh, and we have our line profiler. Um, again, there are two, two different ways of using this line profiler from the command line or from the notebook. So it's always, you see, lots, lot, many of those tools work together notebook, and the developers of these tools, they have the notebook in mind and they wrote extensions for the notebook. Uh, first of all, I would I go back to my measurement directory that I find my file. Yeah? So. And now um, I have this file, profile use line profiler. No, this is a nice short name here. And you see, this is the same thing as before. The only thing is I add a decorator profile here to make it all these two functions will be line profiled. But if you look carefully, there's no import anywhere that imports profile. This just happens out of the blue. This means when I try to run this from here, I get a, er a, um, a type error because there's no such name profile. So when you do it decorate on this way, then you can run the program as it is. You can only run it under the uh, under this line profile program. And that's what I'm doing now. So I get go to my terminal and I need to close this. Does it close it? No, I have to close this uh, this browser here. And um, I go back to my measuring and now I can run it and if I say this the f the the name of to run this line profiler is current prof and then you can turn over both and then you can say profile me use profile me use line profiler ah yeah profile me yeah that's better use line profiler okay and this one doesn't work because I didn't specify, I didn't, if I just used profile me as before, that's another example, then it works and it just uses C profile without anything. Yeah, and the post gives you the, the output. Ah, yeah, it takes se 10 seconds because I have this 10 second thing in here. So it takes about 10 seconds and this is no way to speed it up. I get exactly the same output as before. If I use profile me, then you have to specify also the option L, so it does line profiling. And now it's doing line profiling, and these two functions that actually are marked with a profiler, uh, with a decorator profile, uh, will be line profiled, and now you get a line by line breakdown of my two functions, which is not too interesting here because I only have a loop the for loop itself and whatever happens here. But you can see that the trend, that they give you the, the timings, but typically, most of the cases, very often, just the percentages are more interesting. So only 2.2% uh, of the time is spent in the for loop and 99.8% in waiting here, or fast. And here, of course, it's 100% because the number is so slow that it's around 200%. Yeah? Gives you a line by line breakdown here. So, to make this a bit more interesting, I added a few more scripts that make sense, sense to go line by line here. And the first one is accumulate. Yeah. Accumulate. You see, I put a decorator here. And accumulate is doing the thing what, what the doc, doc string says. So it just adds all the numbers up here and shows you the intermediate result. So zero is there. Zero. Um, plus zero plus one is one. <coughs> yeah, s zero. Yeah, yeah zero, zero plus one is one. One plus two is three. Uh, 
3 plus 3 is 6, 6 plus 4 is 10, and so on. Yeah, so it's ac it just adds up the number and keeps an immediate result, so to speak. And I wrote it in a pretty verbose way to make it easier to actually profile. So uh, I start to take the first one, make a new list out of the first element, go to the all other elements from the second one, fetch the last value, add in the old value plus this element, and then append the new value. You can write all this in one line. But since line profiler gives me a line by line break one, I wrote it in three lines to see how much time it takes. It's just an example to experiment again a little bit. And of course, now we have to run this one from the command line with the same options. And then instead of profile me, we just say um, accumulate. And then you get this breakdown and you see where the time goes. And you see pretty interestingly, most of them take about more or less between 20 and 30% of the time. If you look at percentages, pretty even, more or less, what happens here. There's no line that takes longer than uh, the other lines. So this can be can be helpful. Um, another example, load, um, what's the next one? What's the next one? With a nice name, calc. Just some calculations, mathematical calculations, where I do a few calculations. So I repeat something in the loop, and I just say number uh, plus 10, number times 10, times to the power of 10, and then using instead of this operator power, you use a power function, square root, and I use master square root, and here I set square root to a local name and use local name. Yeah. So just as an example, using um, some of these different operations, you see this, there's a difference. Yeah. Of course, this is a synthetic ex thing, just to, to s compare, but you can see something. You see uh, a plus and multiplication takes about the same amount of time. Power is more expensive here. And see this built-in function power takes a bit longer than the operator. It's not a lot, but so this of course, um, this is always percentages here. You can also look at the uh, uh, absolute numbers, how, how different it is. And you can see there's a small difference here um, saying mass dot square root number or just square root number. This is a bit faster because you serve, uh, save some uh, uh, lookup. Yeah. So here you always have to look up the name mass first, which it finds it in the global namespace, and then for mass it's square root. And here it f looks up square root, and which it finds right up there. So it saves a few lookups, which makes it a bit faster. <coughs> <coughs> this might be important or not important, depending on whatever how, how heavy the computation is. The heavier the computation, the less important it is, of course. If this is a very fast function and you use it a lot, then this is relatively more important. Yeah? But you, you can get a feeling. So it's always good to, to understand a little bit where the, the problems could be. Uh, and this is program is simple enough that you can quickly understand this. Let's continue this referencing thing a little bit. Local ref. So I have here um, a function that's just doing the referencing. So I make a dummy profile just to make it runnable. And then I have here this function that's doing exactly this. And now I, I don't do anything else, I just do the referencing. I make a local name and reference the local name. And here I say dot master square root, which has this lookup. You have to find math first, which you cannot find in this function. Goes to the global space, finds mass and mass and has to look up the square root. Yeah? This attribute access there. And then I have a function here uh, that's running. And I can actually run this from the command line. But actually, I don't have to run it from the command line. I can actually say load extension line profiler. So I, I do have it in my config file, but line profiler, that's why I get this um, error message, because I have loaded it already in my, in my Jupyter config file. And then you can say LP run here. You can say LP run, and then you can actually uh, run your functions. And now you have to do something, you have to specify the function I would like to run, and also the functions that I would like to to measure. So you have to specify uh, um, to execute this first. I have my oh. what did I do here? 
So it doesn't work, so we just take it away for now here. Can take all this stuff away because I don't need it. So I have this functions defined without any decorator. So I change it a bit. And now I have to say I would like to have this function named local ref and module ref. Local ref function and the function uh, module ref and the function test itself. Not I don't need test itself. I want to have both of them line profile and then I run the function test as it is. Yeah? And give it a counter. Yeah? And it takes a while. Now it runs a function test and uh, I have to explicitly lose use dash f here, which is equivalent to putting the profile in front of it. And of course it takes a while uh, because this makes things slower. So you can see I just executed the cell and took a fraction of a second to run it, and now how long we have to wait to get it there. So it's quite a bit of overhead. And then you see um, the breakdown, and kind of counterintuitively, because we looked before, then we, s we saw quite a bit difference between referencing, but if we do it like this, there's only 51 to 49%, and here's 47 to 52%, which is the extra one. So it's a bit slower, but not too much. So it's not, I expect it to be more, because it's always kind of sold as a trick to do this local referencing, to make it faster, but this suggests it's not that big for this case. Hmm. Yeah. Of course, there's not, big, not a big difference here between both of them. The one is doing this referencing, one is doing this referencing. And you can do the same thing a little bit differently. Uh, go one step further, uh, local versus global. Local ref uh, built in. What's the name? I forgot the name of the file. Local reference and. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. Local reference. That's a different local group. It's later. I mix it up. So that's what we have here. So you can see there might be some, some improvement here. And you can run it and you can s compare the. the results of these bows, which is not that impressive, less than I thought. Okay, good. This would be a short overview of profiling CPU. This Python C profiler, the line profiler, and SnakeWish, these are some tools. Um, let's do a short exercise, a few minutes. On page 32 and 33, so I give you two functions there, the source code is available. So if you go in the measurement directory, it's called create list. And these are two functions that create a list in a, again, very generic, stupid way. It does no need to do it. You can always uh, say uh, uh, re um, list reverse something. But here I'm creating a new list starting an empty list and say insert zero and insert something at the first position, which is a very stupid way of doing it, but just it's good to measure. And I achieve the same thing by starting this empty list append to the list, which ends up with a list in the wrong direction, and just reverse the whole list at the end. And these two functions, they both have start with 10,000. Please uh, use some of the tools here and profile uh, them to time it, do profiling, and see what the differences are between both of them. And see where, th where the time goes by visualizing uh, the output. Okay, I just turn off my mic a bit. And I, I will walk around. If you have questions, just ask me. Try a uh, few things. Maybe you find something uh, new, interesting. Just a few minutes shouldn't take too long. So that's why I gave you the, the, this ones already. You just have to play around with them a little bit and use some of the tools we have here and see the differences and find out what the differences are and also potentially why they are there.
Okay, who has some measurements? Some things that are different ways of doing it. I just show you a few things you, you can do. Um, so we have our two functions, and of course now the first thing when you're in the notebook, the most simple thing would be using time it to get some timings first. Yeah, time it, and then say insert zero using the default ten thousand, and then do the same thing. Time it. Um, append reverse. So you have to be careful when you do this, you always look at the unit, yeah, because they put units here. Here's a milliseconds, microseconds, and so on. Uh, you have to be careful to look at these because they're different units. So if you look at number, but you can also, if you want to, store the result. Yeah? So you can say result insert equals insert. And then, of course, you have to say dash "-o", that produces now uh, an output object. And I can same the same thing, result append, append, yeah? And also this option. It can be useful, because then you can calculate the difference between both of them. Insert divided by result append, and you see, uh, no. This is an object, and you want to have the average. Of course, you cannot just <laughs> divide the objects themselves, but the average value of both of them. And you see now it's a factor of 27 faster. So it makes it easier. You don't have to look at the numbers and do the calculation in your head. It just makes it a, a factor of 27 faster. And of course, now you can increase this. Yeah. So instead, so you can provide an n. Say now n uh, is. Um, 100,000 and do the same thing for your for your n and do this for the n and then you can just repeat it and then you do the calculation again and see how long it takes when it's uh, the thing is 100,000 so it takes a bit longer now here and then you see that there might be a big difference So, it doesn't. If you look at it, you have to always say, okay, this is two, two seconds, nine milliseconds. It's like two thousand versus nine. Now it's a factor of two hundred fifty. And you see, if you make it much bigger, you will get much. The difference gets much bigger. Um, the question: What's going on? Of course, now you can do some profiling. You can say LP run, and you do the same game again, and you can ins. Um, use uh, insert zero and run it and you can do the same thing not LP run P run and then you can say P run uh, append reverse and run append reverse here and you okay now of course I have to look at the results first <laughs> uh, this one, insert zero, and you can see where the time goes, and you see all the time actually goes in this um, insert function here. Also, all the time goes in the search function. Now, maybe it's a bit too s too fast. So, if I say insert zero n, which is now hundred thousand, then I, s I might see a nice result. You see, two seconds here. Uh, goes pretty much into in insert function at this time. And insert function is called many, many, many times, and the rest is kind of natural. That's no big thing. If I do the same thing for uh, append, then you see append is also called most of the time, but the time is much, much, much less. Yeah. So this is the way you can approach it. You can do timing, you can do profiling. Now you could also do line profiling. Look at You can make a picture, which might not be that necessary because pretty clear uh, and you see what's going on and of course the reason is we will see this uh, append is very efficient so when python creates a list it makes a list bigger than it needs to be and allocates some additional space at the end and that's a formula it's like more or less 50 percent or something like this not exactly but makes it quite a bit bigger and when it reaches this it gets another bigger chunk of memory and makes it even bigger and even bigger 
So if you have here 100,000 appends, you only have a few allocations of memory, where insert zero makes a full copy of the full list every time, because the list is everything nicely in memory, and if you append the first uh, element, it doesn't work. You have to copy, make a new list, put the first element, and copy all the rest, which is very inefficient. And especially copying memory is pretty slow. That's why there's big difference here. And here you only have to do this copying once at the end. Reverse and append is very efficient. And in fact, I remember the last time in the user group, we spent an hour trying to make something any anything faster than append. It's not possible. It's very optimized inside. There's no way to, in our pure Python, to get anything faster than, than this append. Yeah? There's that's it. But it gives you some insight and then understand that append is better. We have uh, we look at this later on and we make a picture when we look at memory usage. Good. This is profiling CPU. Now you get a basic understanding how it works. The thing is, when you do it, you have to apply these tools. And you can apply the tools as they are, but you can also use these tools and make your own tools out of them by doing things you would do out of uh, manually in a more uh, automatic fashion. We will do this later when we look at data structure. We will use some of the tools again to do some measurements and some data structures. And you can see what you can do. There are different ways of doing it. And there's no right or wrong. Depends very much on what you're actually doing. And something is kind of iterate. You have to go through step by step and find out what works, what doesn't work, and change a few things. So we still have 10 minutes. And I would like to start the next topic because we don't have so much time. The next topic is. Uh, memory profiling. So there's no built-in tool in Python standard library for memory profiling. I, I looked at several tools and I have one that's called PY Ampler here. And this is interesting because it helps you to measure memory. Measuring memory is not that simple. Um, and we use this tool here because it provides a few things to help you to measure the whole memory. You can measure memory to a certain degree just with a sys module. Remember, if you have sys, you can say sys get size of, and you can measure the size of this object, and you can say, like an integer in Python has, Python 3, 28 bytes. This measures the size of one object. But you have to be careful if you do this, you say sys get size of, yeah, and let's m let's make two lists. I make a list with three integers, and I make a list uh, list one. I make a list with three sublists. Now I killed my <laughs> piece here. So, and if you look at this, if you look at this, then you will see uh, when, when I say get size of my list one, and I say this get size of list two, They have the same amount of memory, but but doesn't make sense because you have three integers here and you have three lists, um, but they still take the amount of same amount of memory because you with get size of you only measure the size of the list itself, but not of the elements in the list. It doesn't matter if this just a number or just another gigantic uh, gigantic list with another million elements. It's just a pointer, so to speak, just the reference to this object. Nothing else. And there are, uh, to my knowledge, there's no other. Uh, um, function in the standard library that's doing some more measurement. Pure ampler, what we have here, it's doing a bit more. So I can say, from I had a different import, makes it makes it faster. Import uh, tracker. That's a tracker module, and then I can say my memory is tracker dot summary tracker. The different function, we use summary tracker here, and that takes a while, that's okay. And then uh, if I look at this one, this should be, when I say um, print diff, this should be about zero. 
So it prints a difference to before. We didn't have any before. And you see it's not exactly zero. There's uh, quite a few kilo kilobytes of stuff here. But you see it's a table. And you get all the objects that are currently there, uh, the types, the objects, and the total size of them. If I call this again, then all of a sudden uh, it gets smaller. And we have now it's no kilobytes, only bytes. So and you also see there's negative. There are no negative objects. Th this mistakes. It's not totally exact. But if you measure memory, don't look at the kilobyte. It's like megabytes is okay. But it's not about small amount of memory. Of course, me looking for lots of memory, so it's okay if there's a small mistake here. So there's a few kilobytes. And if you do this again, um, you get also no. Yeah, there's only one negative object and things. That's about more or less zero. You see, it's now a bit bigger again. It's not supposed to be there because there shouldn't be any difference. But uh, the notebook is doing some work in the back properly, then things change. So this would be zero. And now I can, and can make a list. I create an, a big list. Um, do it like this, 10 million, that's this way. And now if I do the same thing, memory, print difference, now it takes a bit longer. And now you should see the difference here should see the difference and now you see it created a list with a million elements about 8 megabytes yeah, it's about 8 million entries uh, no about 1 million entries sorry with, uh, with this uh, size here um, of a point of eight, uh, 8 bytes and that's about 8 megabytes more or less and the integer we see in 28 per piece um, I created a million, but it says only 990,000. Why is less than a million? Anybody knows why I don't get a million? Yeah? Yes. Uh, in C, Python, the numbers from minus 5 to 256 are cached, so they are created only once. Yeah? You can actually you can prove this. Um, get ref count of... Uh, of a number like a five, you see, and then there are, there are 500 references to this, this one. This, the, five, the object five exists only once, and there are 500 references to it. And typically, the winner with the most references is typically which number? Zero. Uh, 6,000 references to zero. Yeah. A reference is eight bytes, um, a number is 24, uh, 28. So we save quite a bit, and it's also a bit faster when you do referencing. So this is just an internal thing. As long as objects are mutable, it doesn't really matter if you have the same object or two different objects that are equal. If it's numbers, numbers, tuples. If they are mutable, you cannot do this. Of course, it would be a would disaster. Yeah? That would be totally wrong. But if it's immutable, so that's why you can do this optimization in the background. And then if, if you do an issue, you get a, a true because they are, they are identical. Yeah? That's why I don't have this. Um, numbers here but you see now the changes and that's the way you can work so you can use this summer tree tracker to get a snapshot of your current memory usage do some changes and get another change yeah so if you do this again there won't be any changes yeah if I do this again then I will be back to my kind of zero or kind of baseline yeah, this pretty much the baseline, less than a kilobyte there. Um, and if I now delete my list, which would hopefully remove it, uh, probably this doesn't have any effect. There should be a release now, but since we're in a notebook, and the notebook keeps references to objects alive. So it has a history, and the history has reference to the objects while it keeps it alive. So now my notebook is is a problem here because it's artif it creates artifacts that are not supposed to be there. If you work from the normal interactive line, you should see a difference. Yeah. So this can be tricky. So typically, a notebook is very nice, but sometimes the notebook can be the problem, and you would need to write a script to do to check that actually the memory is released. Yeah. To be aware, because you have a history. So if you if you look at the cell uh, where we created this one. Um, this input and output history, it, I think it keeps it alive somewhere. The notebook is doing a lot of st stuff in the background, and then you might have some strange effects. That's why I don't see uh, a change here. Okay, uh, let's go to our measurement directory. We're here, and now I wrote two small tools with different methods. 
actually use this one to do some measurements. So now we have the basic tool that does a heavy lifting. We're measuring the memory. Now we write our own tool on top of it that makes it useful for our measurement. And I think we should have a break to get a good spot at the thing here. Um, so it's like two minutes to two three, is it right? Yeah. So if you meet here um, 18 minutes past the hour to continue, then you still have 20 minutes. Get a good coffee, then I'll show you the uh, solution for this tool. So meet back in 20 minutes, so it doesn't meet 18 minutes past the hour, and then we continue with this tool.
Okay, so we have one more minute break, but I think we can start. Maybe just a question. Who is here the first time for PyCon? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of people. Wow. So I, I think that's my, my 12th, if I'm not miscounting. So it's uh, been there the first time 2007 and every year ever since. And tutorial wise is number 20, if I think. That's also kind of a anniversary. But let's continue. So I just repeat it a little bit before people come in. So we, we learned how to do uh, um, CPU profiling. And the typical thing, to you would use C profile the first and go line uh, function by function. And only if this doesn't work, do some line profiling. But line profiling you can only do for selected functions, just a few functions. If you have hundreds of functions to do line by line profiling, it's potentially way too slow. That's why you do this. The other thing is memory profiling. And we started here with our tool to get um, a snapshot just right now how much memory I'm using. And now I use this thing to write my own tool. And that's typically what, what you typically should do, or very often it's very useful to use some other features of Python and write your own helper tools that automate some of the measurement. How they actually look like depends on what you're actually looking at. And that's a little bit, little bit different. Uh, and that's why it just, it's just an example. I, I wrote two small tools here that help you to do something. Memory, see, I have some of them. I still have versions with HPy, um, still there, uh, but I don't cover this. is a, yet another tool to measure memory, but um, I use this newer one. I think it's also Python 2.7 only, but I'm not sure. So um, the first one is size for our example. Okay. So uh, these are the first, this first line from future import print functions only for Python 2. So it works with Python 2, the same thing, the only difference here is the print function and here this uh, X range thing. And then I import func tools and sys from the standard library and, I and import the tracker here. And I use a global dictionary memory where I actually put the memory. So there are different ways of doing it. If you want to store something with a name, the first thing would be using a dictionary. And that's what I'm doing. And I use a global one. Uh, uh, you can also use other approaches, but this would work. And I write a decorator. Who of you wrote a decorator before? Uh, about half of it. Good. So a decorator is a function, this one, that takes a function and it returns a new function, typically. Yeah? And you use, it as you use it with this. The usage is very easy. Just put it there, no matter what it does. Writing is a bit more involved. Writing one is a bit more involved. And typically, you have a nested function. You can do it the other way, but typically you have a, this is a function that takes a function, and inside you write a replacement function that actually replaces the original function. And of course, what it's doing is doing typically that what the original function is doing plus something in addition. And in this case, we do memory measurement. So we, we don't want to change the original functionality, we just want to add something. In this case, we want to add memory measurement. Okay, let's look what I'm doing here. So this is my my uh, I use func tool wraps, so when you write a decorator, you should use, funnily enough, another decorator to write a good decorator, which is called func tool wraps that, that helps you to keep the name and the doc string and those stuff alive, otherwise they would disappear from the version of function. But then let's look at the core of this function. So I get here my memory tracker and uh, uh, summary tracker, and I call diff twice. So of course I want to set it to zero, so once maybe not enough, I call it twice. You don't want to overdo it because it takes might take some time to do this. And then I say function, and I call this args, keyword args, which actually calls the original function with the arguments I, I have here. But before I say return, I do the same thing, uh, all thing in the try finally, because this return won't be active yet, but before this rest will be returned, I do this. I do another diff and store this one in the dictionary. I, I use a function name as a key. No, the name of the function this is a string as a key and get this diff here measured. And then I return. So this rest is still alive and only when I return, because this rest is a local thing, it will, will disappear. So if I don't create a reference outside, th this object will be a go away and there's no, no memory change. But I do the measurement before. That's a trick. So the try finally trick if you want. I can do something like this. Yeah. So I measure this memory here. And now 
this is my example function. This does nothing else but creating a big dictionary. Yeah, I say yeah, create a big dictionary. And I call this function, but I, I don't save the return value. But nevertheless, if I do this, you see it takes a while because it has to set the memory back twice to zero, which takes a while, then it has to do a third memory measurement, so I call the diff three times, twice there and one here. And you see, the result is that this global dictionary gets be filled with a function name, which is this one. Yeah. So this function name is this string, because the function has a name. Yeah. Every function has attribute name. Make big has a name, which is make big as a string. So it knows its own name. And then I store the result. You see I have this integer, my close to a million integers, minus this 256 uh, that are not there. 57 here. 57, yes, zero, zero counts also. And then the, the, the list itself, which has my about 8.8 .8 megabytes you know, now. 1024, that's why it's not, uh, not exactly 8, but a little bit more here. Yeah? Okay, then you see the changes, and the thing is, even though there are, there's no, nothing left after the function, I measure the memory before the function returns, so what the function is actually doing. So this would be a trick, and you have a decorator, and you can use a decorator in your program, and this would fill the, the, this dictionary with a thing. <coughs> the small problem is a function called multiple times would override it. So if you want your function called multiple times, you might need to modify this one and just keep a list of all the memories, do an average, do a minimum, maximum, whatever you like. So you can modify this function. This one, when you call the function again, would override it and override it and override it. But this would be an example. So a decorator uh, is a very good tool. Yeah? So if you never have to write a decorator, you, you might understand this one. It's a bit too complicated. If you wrote one, it's pretty clear. If you have never written a decorator, it, it, you have to read up how to write decorators. Uh, in general, it's not very difficult. It's just applying the fact that everything is an object in Python, functions are objects, so you can create a function, return a function. So there's nothing spe special about it in Python. Good. So it's one tool, writing a decorator, and you can use a decorator of different things. It's a very simple one. You might need to modify it to fit your purposes. Second one. Yeah. Now I have this... Uh, Growing memory, and now I don't use I don't use a decorator, but I use something that's a bit different. I use a function that takes a function as the first argument. Yeah, typically those functions are called higher order functions. A function that takes arguments, uh, function as argument or return functions are higher order functions, typically. Um, and this is a bit different here because now I don't use a decorator, but I can still use it programmatically. And I do a similar thing. I, I make an instance of a tracker, turn it back to zero call my function and remember the difference. But there's no try finally here. There's no replacement. And now I have a test function. Actually, I have two functions here. One that creates a list and returns it, and the other one that modifies a global. Here I have a global data list, and this one is just appending to this list. So it's changing. It's like example. So a simple thing is very clear. This is changing global, uh, changing the size of a global structure. And of course, after the function is finished, the structure must still be changed, and you can measure the memory change. And if I run this one, again, it takes a while because you have to turn it back, and then it's called twice for those two functions because that's how I call them. Yeah, I give the function in, um, here, the function, the argument, the function, the argument. And you see, there's no change here because this function just returns a list, and I don't create a reference to this one, so it's gone. But here, this changes the global structure, and now I have exactly the same change in size because I create a million elements in this list. Yeah. And this would be, if, if you want so, that could be a memory leak if, it's, if you don't want this effect. So if, if there are still memory, more memory than before and it's not supposed to be, then it's a memory leak if you don't plan for this. Yeah. And this would be a little bit different thing. Now you could go and feed them all the functions uh, in the list. You can write another tool that goes through all your libraries and feeds all the functions and runs it. It's a bit different, different approach. Depends what you want to do, then you can see if there's a memory leak somewhere. Good. Okay. Another application.
list calls print plan. This is interesting. So I use different um, different measurement functions to measure the size of an object. You see, I implement uh, from, from a size of a uh, import a size of a flat size, <coughs> and I also use this get ref uh, get get size of sorry this get size of at three different functions to measure something. And this is my function I want to measure. I provide the length and the a size function. So this function here is one of these three, which will be an argument. But I have a new empty list, and I have another list which has a memory size, the current memory size that belongs to the list. And I go through a number of elements, and I append each element to the list. So my list increases by one element, and at the same time, my list of the list size also increases by one element, which is uh, represents the list size. Uh, so if I append one, and I say, okay, the size for one, the list of s size one is so much, the list of size two is so much, and so on. Okay, and then I do a little bit plotting down here. This is just display code. This is just creating either a table. If you don't have Matplotlib installed, if you have Matplotlib installed, it uh, makes a plot. We don't have to turn on Matplotlib inline to actually see the plot. So I don't want to go into Matplotlib here, so but this is just a plotting library to, to visualize what's going on. When it runs for a while, uh, yeah. If I if I call main, it runs for a while. I have to call main. And then uh, you see this plot. And you have these three functions here. And you can see what you can see here, how the list grows and how the memory grows. And this very interesting. You see this kind of uh, staircase thing. So this is how this memory grows. And that's what actually happens, hap happens with append. So th the size of the memory is nicer to see here. So here it, it gets a kind of a big chunk of memory here. Yeah, and makes the list bigger. And then the list stays the same until it hits the end again and allocates another big, another big. And you can see this steps get longer and longer and longer and longer. That's what I said. How this works, and now it's visualized. It's, uh, if I don't know. Some people work better when they see something, and it's pretty easy to explain how this steps get longer and longer because the allocation takes more and more memory here. And this is actually this measures only the size of the list itself. Then you see it in very nice steps. Yes, yeah. So it's a function of the size. That's actually a formula. And if you look in the Python C source code, there's a formula that calculates how much memory you allocate. Like yeah, something like this. It's not exactly that some uh, dynamic formula. So I, I, don't I cannot recite the formula out of my head, but you can find it in the source code. And then it's always getting bigger and bigger. And the bigger the list, the more memory you get. And this is very efficient. So <coughs> that means you allocate more memory than you actually need. It looks quite a bit. But if you look at this picture, it, it looks different. Because now this also measures the memory of the, the integers you use. You see it has increasing growth. You see now the step is much less pronounced. It's not so <laughs> just a little bit, because you have measures. Th the so relative to the whole memory of the program, it's not that much but makes your program much faster, as we see this in zero and append reverse thing. And this is these are the two functions we imported, and these are the this is standard sys get size of function, which is exactly the same as this one. Yeah. So you see, that helps you to visualize, make a small picture here, a small diagram to see how things look like. Um, So now we can also count how many of these allocation steps you will have depending on the size of the list. And now I modify my function a little bit. Yeah, you see I do this uh, get size of as a standard here. I have my list, I have my steps, my size function, which I I give you the, the size of an integer. So I know how big an integer is. And then I have my old size, which gives me the size of the list. And I go through. And I append, and then I check if the old size and new size is greater than the inside steps. And I, I know I have uh, one of those steps, those jumps, 
Yeah? Of course, it's, it's bigger than just an int, and I have a, a jump, and then I in increment my steps. I say, just count how many steps I have. That's what I'm doing here. So I can't just count how many steps I have. And then I do it for different sizes, from 10 up to 10 million. It will take a while. And then you see, uh, if I have 10 appends, I have three allocations, three steps. If I have 100, I have 10. If I have 1,000, I have 27, and so on. And if I have 10 million, I have 104. And it's a big difference. If I have 10 million allocations or 104, that's a very, very big difference. Yeah, allocation is pretty slow so compared to just some computations. And you see, I get the same result with both methods, which is supposed to be like this. That shouldn't be a difference. Yeah? So then this is can be helpful that you can see, oh, yeah, that's what happens. And if you want to, you can add another one. The power eight should still work to the nine, which I think it's not. You don't have a memory most of the time, yeah. But you should see this this pattern, and then you can see how many steps you have. So it's the same information as before, but now represented just the number of steps for going the list here. So that can be useful and give you some uh, insight, and you can actually prove the whole thing. Okay, um, this is. Something you can do, you can do this user's tool. There's also a tool for using a uh, measuring um, uh, line by line. So you can measure memory line by line. Unfortunately, uh, here on my Mac, this doesn't work too well. So I still show you. Uh, but it's a good example that when you have a tool, you, you cannot just blindly trust those tools. You have to check if this tool is doing the right thing. Maybe those tools are designed for something and you use it in a different context or something like this. Um, and as far as I know, uh, Max, they, they compress memory. You know, there's a memory compression. If you look at the memory thing, they compress memory. And this throws this tool off, obviously. That's my assumption here. Uh, so uh, there can be some, some problems when you do something like this. Was this tool actually is running? I kind of run from the from here. You have to do it from a um, extra script because it's asks the operating system how me much memory the program takes uh, at a certain amount of time. And I have this use memory function here. That again, I the same approach. I put a profiler he profile here, and then I have I do a few th different things. I create a sum out of a list comprehension. So a list comprehension creates an intermediate list, and then I make a sum. I make a sum out of a general expression which doesn't create one. I make another sum. Uh, then I keep the list um, around here. Then I lead this uh, this list, and then I delete. Um, uh, sorry, then I sum up the list and then delete it, and then make a string of a certain size and delete and so on. So I do a few things to create, use up some memory, and free the memory. And here I should should have a good feeling what actually happens because I need memory, I free it again and so on. And now I run it and com see what's going on. So I have this um, Python and I use this M again and then I call this uh, memory profiler. It's called memory underscore profiler. And I have to provide the use memory thing. And that also takes a while. So because it's it has to actually after every line of Python it has to stop and ask the operating system how much memory does this process use. And then you see a similar apprentice to my CPU thing. So now you get this uh oh, I'm not finished yet here, still running. There's a CPU thing. <laughs> But unfortunately, as uh, you can try it in different operating system, maybe it works better on Linux or on, on Windows, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's it's a good example. If you use a tool, it's always a good thing to have kind of a baseline thing to do something you understand and try to measure and see if if this agrees with your measurement. Very important. And you will see here it doesn't really agree with what you measure, so it's it's there, and but it's yeah, maybe not so. Not so useful. It takes a long time, isn't it? I don't remember that it takes so long. <coughs> yeah. 
Okay. Let it run. Uh, uh, maybe I, c I continue. Uh, but <coughs> the thing is, if if <coughs> if you look at this, uh, the results are not very conclusive. Something happened that th that don't make a lot of sense. And if you you're not able to interpret what is the thing is doing, we actually know what it's supposed to do more or less. Then it is not too helpful to use it as a tool somewhere else. So it's uh, um, yeah, not too useful here. And the same. Okay. In the meantime, I we let it run. <laughs> make a new notebook um, because we want to continue. Only have one hour left, so we don't have too much time. Uh, and I want to give you now. Now we know how to measure. Now how to approach your things. And there are many different things you can do. And I want this thing. F have a we have a whole week. A whole week. Uh, high performance computing with Python, we'll do more of them. But now we want to focus on algorithms and data structures that can be useful to do something. Because these are the potentially the the most gains you can gain, the most speed or maybe memory savings when you use a better algorithm or data structure. So I make a new uh, notebook. And the first thing I want to show a few anti pattern things you shouldn't do. Um, just a few of them, and then we continue looking at some data structures in Python that can be helpful. And oh yeah, I want to check first if it's still running here. Yeah, now you see, uh, maybe it m makes more sense here. It, it allocates uh, 30 megabytes, but it, it generates this intermediate list and should release a list immediately. Yeah, uh, but here it, it has a general expression, here it releases. It allocates 13 to releases 20 here later. So obviously there's some time shift. It doesn't make too much sense, as you can see here. There's no change here, which is useful. Yeah, there should be a zero here also because it's doing exactly the same. Here it creates a new list. Makes sense. It uses some memory. Uh, when it sums up the squares, it still uses memory. This again does make sense because it just calculates one number. Well, it should use six megabytes of memory. This is still. It's lacking somehow. Yeah, or something. Uh, yeah, when it when it delete, it frees memory. That makes sense. So we still have to do the calculation. The number makes you know, looks like this twenty and fix. It's freed again, more or less. So it should be fine. Yeah. If I do this, is use up memory. If I delete it, yeah, I allocate about a megabyte and at least only a quarter of it. That is all might does make a lot of sense. Maybe it's do the compression or something. I'm not sure. And n nothing changes here. So it's not very conclusive. So I, I, I tried to interpret this one, haven't found any any really clue why it's like this. Probably it's not waiting long enough or th the thing is changing because if you don't use a memory, then the operating system is compressing something or what I was doing. So it's not not too useful. Okay, let's go back to our, our next one for algorithms and uh, data structures. So I just want to show you a few uh, anti-patterns or some things you should not do, actually. And one classical one is string concatenation. String concatenation. So when you want to create a string from other strings. So and um, often you can do something like this. You start with an empty string, and then you say for, you start with an empty string for x in range something. S plus equals string n. Do something like this. Yeah. So, and this is actually pretty fast in normal Python. If you run the same thing in PyPy, you will see 
it takes a very long time because this is an, this is an anti pattern because strings are immutable and if you do this you have to create a new string for every iteration in c python as it is there are some optimization which takes this covers this corner case here that, that it doesn't happen but you cannot rely it if you run it with a different implementation of python this might not be uh, the way to go so if you want to do something like this you wouldn't do a loop like this you would start with a list yeah other way around l equals an empty list would have the loop and then instead of saying plus equal you would say l append you append we just learned append is very efficient and at the very end you say uh, s2 is dot join which is one operation which creates a string out of the list l yeah and this would be actually the way to do it uh, because now we, we take advantage of the fact we just learned that append is efficient and the plus equal is not efficient officially even though it's optimized uh, but if you try the same thing in PyPy we say that it would be very long so maybe you can time it so if you have something like this you should be able to do the time it uh, in the for the whole cell yeah so that's what we want and for the whole cell and if you look at this here it's not really a big difference if you do the same thing in PyPy then we say a big big difference in terms of <coughs> runtime so it's still if you look at the documentation Python still not recommended to do this yeah. even though it's potentially not a big not a problem okay this is one anti-pattern the other one is actually uh, being lazy so uh, Everything has to do with lazy evaluation. There's a everything Python 3 offers a lot of things. A lot, a lot of places mm -hmm. Python 3 gives you back uh, iterators, yeah. map, zip, and so on. They give you back iterators that used to be lists in the past. And this is something that's uh, pretty common. But also when when you write something yourself, then you it's typically better to be lazy. Uh, not generating data structures, the temporary intermediate data structures that you throw away immediately, because this takes memory and potentially also is a <coughs> uses more memory. So if I do something like this, uh, I can say I want to have the this, this sum of um, x times x for x in uh, range n then I can sum up something like this and I generate a new intermediate list here or if I just use a generate expression which is a small change and this uses less memory yeah and this should it doesn't generate this intermediate list so for this million elements, if I have my n up there, that this doesn't make too big a difference. Let's time it. Let's time it if there's a difference here. So, yeah, so it's a bit faster. It's not much, not much. Uh, if you make your n bigger and bigger and bigger and you see this version will always work no matter how big your n is it just takes longer and this one will break down because you don't have enough memory and you have to be careful i think um, if you do things in numpy and you want to allocate a gigantic array you get a memory error right away here it tries to allocate much mem a lot of memory and uh, it might happen that it freezes your operating system if it's too big because it tries to get more and more and then you start swapping and as soon as you start swapping everything goes down in fact a hundred so you can't do anything anymore so <laughs> be careful <laughs> yeah if you don't know the n if it's like if several orders of magnitude bigger than a million then depending on how much memory you have and how much free memory you have is not going to work uh, and also it slows down things immensely yeah so going lazy wherever it is is just an example generate expressions uh, in python 3 you get it uh, many places uh, using idle tools and those kind of things that can be can be pretty useful places to 
save memory but also make things faster uh, depends where you are okay another thing the scope do you, do you can you kind of shorten the scope this is local we had this before right clickly and that's what I thought <coughs> local mm -hmm. source optimizing nice I'm here algorithms algorithms yeah so I have two small examples which can be useful so local versus global so uh, we had this before already uh, pretty much so if I have a global variable here and I access this global one from in within the loop like here or I make this global a local and then access in inside the loop then I get uh, some different results and I do the profiling here uh, this is one for 100 million uh, loops and do some profiling and you see there's a difference this is a difference for this repeat and repeat local and instead of 3.8 seconds it takes 3.2 seconds it's significant but you see I don't do anything else I only access it and there's no other computations so if you do a lot of other things it might well might be relatively very small the next one taking the whole thing is a step further not only going uh, global taking a built-in so it's just another dictionary to look up and see I have this um, sum so if it looks for sum in the function cannot find it goes to the global cannot find it finds in the built-in so it's looking up looking up every time doing the loop here I do the same thing I create a sum so typically you want to put an underscore there if, if you don't have the original sum here and just have this one and use this sum and then I compare and then you see uh, if you do the same testing it will be a bit faster if you do this so that's a few things you can do here uh, and now you see my time goes down from 4.3 to 3.1 second which is significant at this place but again I don't do anything else just do this referencing so if you do a lot of other computations it might be relatively so small it doesn't matter too much Depends. Good. Um, just just some two examples here. Um, okay. Let's go and look at some data structures. Uh, this is our next topic. Data structures and data structure algorithms are very close. Yeah, because all the data structures in Python come with their own algorithms, and they provide uh, sometimes pretty sophisticated algorithms, and you can use them. And I want to show them, show you some of them. Uh, and the first one would be list list versus set so and I have here I prepared uh, some of these um, examples here because it, it would be too much typing to it interactively and also it can be helpful to see how we can apply tools so I tried different ways to apply tools here and again the example is very simple I have a list and I want to find if something is in a list I say so okay element in list how long does it take and of course I do the same thing for set this is very very simple so most of you will know this difference but as an example so I make a list and then I of, of the range n and I search for n of course n the length itself is not in the list you have to go through the whole list that's the worst case here the worst case scenario uh, and I use a, diff a different way of measuring here I say I want to have the start timestamp I do my in and I do the diff difference with this timestamp yeah and I do the same thing for my search and then I have a small function that actually calling both of them and calculates the ratio so it gets this time and this time and returns both of them and gives a ratio and then I wrote an yet another one this one is just generating a table so that's there's not much logic in here this is just a uh, it's not a complicated logic it's just generating a table that calls this one for different sizes and produces a nice looking table it doesn't take too long to do a table like this but uh, when you run it 
yeah then you see and you have the output in the table nicely formatted and you can uh, see the speed up when you look something up in the list it's not in there and look something up in the set it's not there depending on the size of your structure yeah how many elements you have you see the absolute times of the list and the set and you see the ratio yeah you can see if if it's small 10 this is two and a half times faster if you go up to 10 million it's 77,000 times faster yeah so of course you have to go through the whole list and you can see nicely that this search time, every time I get 10 times bigger, it takes about 10 times longer. You see this here, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 1, so 10 times more. Yes, it is. A set, you can think of a set being a dict with only keys, even though the implementation is different. So in Python 3.6, dictionaries are sorted. They keep in search and sorter. Sets don't. So it's not exactly the same, but for main, for if if you find yourself using dictionaries and don't use the keys, uh, the values at all, then you're probably looking for a set. So there are some implementation differences, but if you think of it as a, in a big way, uh, a set is si pretty much a dictionary with only keys. It's not that wrong. Yeah, actually, uh, in, in Python three. Um, Keys, uh, dictionary keys support uh, those set operations like intersection, difference, and so on. They don't have a method intersection, but they can use the, the operator, the, the, the ampersand for the intersection, for instance. Yeah. So keys and dictionary behave just like sets in this regard. Can be interesting. The thing is, you pay with memory. A dictionary that stores only none as values takes about a factor of four memory from a list or so the same thing. And a set also needs more memory. So you need more memory. But typically it's a good deal if you get 77 times faster, if you take four times the memory, oh, it's a pretty good deal. And you can always put more memory in a computer. That's most of the time it's possible if you want to to make your computer bigger with memory, making your processor much faster is just impossible. You can put more processors, but that would be very different because it would be in parallel and it doesn't help. Yeah. So well, very often it's a deal with the algorithm thing or the data structures that use more memory to make things faster, which is most of the cases a good trade-off. So now there's one thing. Uh, the set is actually constant in time, so it should be the same time, no matter how big the set is, but it's not true. There's uh, quite a bit differences here. There's a factor of 10 difference. So it uh, seems like for these very short times, um, our default timer is not very good. Just something so if you when you measure something or something takes long, you c it's pretty okay, but you cannot make the match. Even if you make a make a small mistake, it relatively is very small to the measure time. If something's very fast, then you have to be very careful what you're actually measuring. And th that's why I modified my uh, my program a little bit, and I actually used now multiple runs, searching multiple yeah now um, I just rewrote the part that is a bit different now and not don't only one I do multiple runs and I, I, I took this uh, time it from uh, from the notebook as an example so you see here I have a duration which I hardwired here which you also could make a parameter if you wanted to so in I wait you see I have a while loop in here that says as long as it duration is less than a second, I keep repeating this measurement, so I measure the time, and I sum up the duration here. Yeah. And um, of, of course I have to count, because in the end I, I don't want to have the total time, I want to have the time pro lookup, and then I have to divide by the time. And also I have a repeat of 7, which is in standard way there. So two things, a repeat is the outer loop, and then the time, which is 1. And if I do the same thing, I run, it takes a bit longer now because of the same times. You see, uh, uh, it has to uh, produce those numbers one after the other. Um, and there are some overhead in here also, of course. It's always a bit tricky because I measure my measuring. And I'm not really sure how, how wrong it is, but you see, uh, it will improve in terms of this set time. Oh, that takes a while. 
takes quite a bit of time. But the rest is the same, and I also use the same compare function. So I made my compare function here a little bit general because you see this compare function takes um, um, column names and takes a few things. You wouldn't write it like this. Of course, I wrote it in after because I want to reuse a function. I don't want to <laughs> re-implement the whole thing. And so you can specify the actually the, the calculate function as an argument. You ha can have a header line, and you have the, the names of the columns. Which is always colon set, list and set here. But yeah, and if I do this, now it starts producing output. And, um, and if you look at the times, the our set times that used to be here uh, 2 to the minus 7, to, to, uh, to one to, uh, 2 to the minus 6 here, with some variations. Now, if you look at them, you will see they are uh, m more consistent here. Still running, still running, still running. Uh, so the last one might take quite a while. Maybe I should run it in the console, not here because it takes too long. But you can see this time is very, very consistent. It's always the same. It's a bit faster, yeah. But it's always about 1.3 to minus seven. Improves. It improves. So I run this from the command line. Of course, this will will take a bit of time. So now I need to op properly. Uh, And I may get another one because we want to run a, a new one right away. Okay, so, and I, I kill this one here. Uh, interrupt, yeah, I kill it. So, but you see it, it's very con consistent here, uh, consistent there, but also the ratio, it's bigger. The ratio is bigger if you compare because this time is quite a bit smaller than the other one and it doesn't change anymore. And I let it run uh, in the background of the uh, console. And but I decided why not use, why, why reproduce a magic function? Why not use this magic function directly? And you cannot only use a magic function in notebook, you can even use it programmatically. So I figured this out. The, the head took me a little bit searching, but why reinvent the tool if it's there already? And if you don't want to use interactively there, so you can actually f inform IPython, you can import this term in the active shell. And this has a get IPython function, which is doing something like this. And it allows you to uh, use a run cell magic. So I can run the cell magic here. So instead of typing in percent time it, I can run it out programmatically. You have to provide it as a string. And this will give me this repetition, the seven times repeating and this one time waiting for free in this case. And that's what I did. So it's a little bit more set up. You have to write kind of generate a string which mimics the IPython notebook. And then you see I also have to specify my source code as a string here to make it work because it doesn't work with namespaces too well here. But that's what I did. So it's a bit more work, but I just want to compare if my measuring is correct. Um, and then I get back this I run it with this op option O here which gives me back this object with all the measurements, and then I can say object.average. Yeah? And then I can get the average value and can calculate it. Exactly the same thing. And so now I have, I let it run the background because it takes while this is still doing here. And I do the same thing, Python searching magic, and I do magic measurements. So it gives me results and it will take a while. And you will see, of course, the results for the list, they are always pretty much the same because it takes so long, there's no big changes. But it is right for the set are different because it's so short. Yeah? And there's a lot of overhead. You see now it's very consistent here, 1.3 more or less, minus 7. And here, 3 minus 8. And the set times are sh faster quite a bit faster because we still add to our loop and measurements we introduce some extra thing we measure we cannot get it out of the measurement and here they do something smart potentially to get it out it, at least it's different yeah, which one is right but I believe this magic thing seems like more reliable than my only my myself uh, woven thing here and now you see you get also very consistent times 3 times minus 8 and then 
the list time should be pretty much the same if you compare the list time. Yeah, now here you see so a factor of 900,000 instead of 77,000 is an order of magnitude difference because this is faster but very consistent. And here, uh, even the list is faster here. A bit. Yeah, not much. For the small list, for the, uh, for the bigger list, there's no difference anymore. Good. So there's a way to doing it, and you, you, you can, to some degree, utilize the other tools and put them together, but it makes a sense to spend a bit of time just to make sure that you measure the right thing. And you can see here uh, the differences between these tools. And I put some tables, because then you can compare everything at one glance, and you can look at it. So, uh, sets are better than lists is only half the story. If you have a list anyway, when you need to convert a list into a set and search only once, then it doesn't make a lot of sense because converting the set to a list takes at least as long as searching for this value in a list. Yeah? So, <laughs> you have to be careful what they're, what they're doing, how often you want it. And that's why I now I have yet another variation here, searching uh, creation. So here I also put in the creation. So I, I use my approach. Uh, I use my approach with a, this is a magic function here. You see, I create an, a list, which is uh, here, and then I have to convert the list into a set, and I measure this also, but only for this set. The other one for the list stays the same, and I measure this for the set and then I run this one uh, for different sizes and see if there's a difference if I put the creation in. So now this is finished. This is still running. I was also running now. You see uh, here with this measurements I'm 4 million times faster compared to 77 times faster. So this is a big difference because this time so small and it's really difficult to measure obviously. Uh, now there's the same thing searching uh, creation which includes the creation time and then when I run this one uh, uh, you see this uh, this one measures the creation along size and you see now if I only have 10 then now there's a negative ratio that now the list is faster than the set because you have to you couldn't, couldn't you have to create it at this at this time and you see this one is now not good just to convert a list into a set just for one search doesn't help makes it slower eh, it's slow but if you not only do it once but do it multiple times then it can be useful again so that's not black and white there's always a lot of gray and you always have to look at the use case uh, and then Yet another one, you see, the you can have a lot of those things. Now, I, I don't do it only once, I repeat it. I repeat it here, and then uh, you see, I do this n in my list not only once, but m times. And here I measure the creation, but I look up in my set m times, and then if I do it more than once, then you will see it's getting better and better and better. And it increases with the number of lookups. Uh, you get more and more out of it. So and then I do it for 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 lookups. And then you will see this will take quite a while now. So if you do this and I say repeat it, then we have to wait for a while. So that's why I printed the, the, the results here, repeat it. And now it does it for 10 repetitions, 10 times lookups, or 100, and so on. And then if you see, you will get, the more you look it up, the more it, uh, it's useful. So you have to decide, do I only look it only once, it will be many times, and then there can be very, very different runtime characteristics. Good. So this will take a while, 
Uh, that's why I have prepared this one. So if I jump right there, yeah, so here and the last output, that's what I calculate on this machine here, uh, should be the same here, and this would be the output, and you see when you run it. Now, if you, do, if you look it up 10 times, you are faster using a set. It's not that much, but up to 10 times faster. And then if you do it 100 times, then you get a decent speed up, but you see for different sizes, you get different speed ups. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, if I do a thousand times, then it's really worthwhile. And if you do it even more, and then you see you still now, if, if you do a, a, a 10,000 lookups for a list of 10 million, you get to, to all of them. They have more than a factor of 1,000 faster. Yeah. Then it's worthwhile if you do a lot of lookups, you, look, you get. A Yes, it's some break even, so to speak. If you have several lookups, then it might be useful to convert your list to a set. Plus, you need more memory. If you keep the list alive and you have the set, you need more memory for the set. Yeah, if it if matters or not, it depends how big the set is and how much memory you have. Good, but you can do some tooling. You can create some tables to see what's going on if this is important, and you get a feeling. Yeah, and of course, hopefully, when you do it once for one project, you can take some experience to the next one. Be careful sometimes if you try to take the experience, it might not be the right thing, the right experience. When you take to the next project, those things can happen. Okay, this would be uh, a list versus a set. So a set is an interesting thing. So I have, these are, these are two standard Python data structures, but there's also more data structures, either externally or in the standard library. And the collections module has something called a DEC. DEC. It's a double-ended uh, queue. And this can be useful for certain types of use cases. So sometimes, if you have special cases, you might use different things than list dictionaries and sets. In most cases, they are good enough. But sometimes, you find better structures for your purpose. And you can do something. Also, uh, say from collections import deck so see how a deck works import deck the not only think it type it import deck so so my use case is as follows i i do have a list list range 10 so i have a list like this and i would like to replace to elements. So in our example, let's say 2 to 4 should be replaced, deleted actually, by nothing. But if, if, if I replace a slice with two elements with nothing, then I actually delete it. Yeah. So now the, this, the, the 2 and the 3, number 2 and the 3 are deleted. This means when I delete it, the whole list has to be rewritten. Because everything is contiguous in memory, now I have to take two out, you have to copy the whole list. If you use a deck in a smart way, then it might be better and faster using a deck than a list for this one use case. Because how does a deck work? So I just show you quickly how a deck works here. So I make my deck. Yeah, uh, which is uh, range 10. 10. So now my deck looks like this. It looks very much like a list, but it looks like a deck. So this is, is a, a, a double um, doubly linked list. So Python lists are only good to append and pop from the right hand side. With decks, you can pop and append from both sides. But access in the middle is not efficient. And there's always a drawback. Yeah, but here you can also move things from the, from the left and from the right, and this is very efficient. But doing something in the middle is not efficient. But you can rotate. You can rotate. So I could do something like d rotate minus 4, and I rotate it. Now I delete two of these by using pop. I... Uh, 
sorry, I have to say minus 4. Yeah? Minus 4, otherwise I don't need the right thing. So and now you see I delete the 3 and I delete the 2. And now I have something like this and I have to rotate the whole thing back. Rotate to the 2, the beginning. Yeah? And then I have the same, achieve the same thing. More steps, three steps. But when you measure this, you will see this is faster than deleting the list because you don't have to copy the whole thing back and forth. Yeah? Now, here we have something we have to pay a price. We have to put more work in. We have to write more lines, which means more lines of maintenance. There's only two more lines, but it's more lines. Um, so, and again, I, I wrote this something to measure what's going on. And this time I decided not using this... Uh, uh, Magic thing, but using my own repeated thing, which is because the times are pretty long compared to what the other ones is not that wrong as we saw, pretty close. Um, and so what I'm doing, I have I give it a function, I have my, my helper function it takes a function, the arguments, my repeat or my limit, and it's doing all this trick. So it has a results, it has a repeat. Now the limit is not fixed to one, but it's an argument. Here it has to create the arguments. We see here there's a helper function that dynamically creates new arguments. The problem is, I the big problem is here, I modify a structure. <laughs> and when I re if I want to repeatedly measure something, uh, if the structure is short already, I cannot measure exactly the same thing because the list is getting shorter and shorter and there's nothing left to remove anymore. So I have to recreate the list every time, but I shouldn't measure the recreation because the recreation is just a side effect of measuring. It's not easy, because otherwise you might measure something that's not there. Uh, that's why I have to make this, this is a helper to do this. And here I have my start, I call my function, and I have my end. That's what I'm going to measure. Yeah? But not the recreation of the list, but I have to recreate the list, because I modify a list in a function. Yeah? Okay, now I write my, my remove from, this is the whole thing we just did. 2 to 4 equals nothing. Yeah? Empty list. 2 to 4 start and end here. And this is my deck version. Rotate to the end. Do the pop. End minus start times. Rotate back to the beginning. Yeah. This one line turns into uh, one, two, three, four lines. So it's more work. Yeah. Okay. And now, of course, uh, I have some printout again where I call this function. So I do here uh, some ends. So to have some even amount of elements I delete and then I create this one and see I have to dynamically here have this function that actually creates a new object of the size. So in the loop I can create a new function then hand a new function so I can create it again and again and again. But it took me a while to get it in the it seems like this is the best thing to create this function here that freezes this, you know, this is it finds it a the start and the stop from outside here. Yeah, but I actually, it provided here as arguments. Yeah, I freeze these arguments here, and then because I need to call this function up here. Yeah, and every time I create a new function, and I provide default arguments, and it creates at least default arguments. There might be other ways of doing it. I just decided to do it this way. It just seems obvious to me. It's maybe not obvious to everybody, but that's what I did. And then uh, let's do this Python list deck, yeah, and then you see, um, and now if I replace only one element, my deck version is considering faster, but the more elements I replace, the less efficient this gets. Again, you cannot say decks are faster than lists for these purposes, it depends what you're actually doing, how many elements you move or not. So if you know, like, I only remove letters and there are no, no more than 26 letters or so, then you know that will, that will be, I don't have to look at the use case with 20,000 books, I cannot more than 26 or something like this. Yeah? Just an ex example. So, yeah, but you see uh, this, the same thing. And here I do it for, d for different uh, limits. So I have the very short limits. Not I don't wait a second, only wait a 100,000 of a second and 10,000 of a second. But you see, this is very consistent. So th the limit time deems seems like it uh, doesn't have a lot of influence. That's not clear. Yeah, this is a limit. Because if you do put it to one second, we can look at the results tomorrow. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. You see that it's 100,000 of a second. It took a, a few seconds to finish. Yeah. So it might take a few days then if we put it in a second. 
So now the last one will last so long, but those those values are pretty comparable. It was about 60. If it's 60 or 66, that's for me it's the same. So everything between t I don't know, 10 or 20 percent, I wouldn't be too, too picky about it. Yeah. But now we have some numbers, and you say, okay, the limit can be pretty low. This is a fine. This it doesn't have a big influence, but the size of the list is essential. If as soon as it gets too big, now I get a negative effect. I get slower. So I put a lot of work to make it slower. Uh, that's not very useful. Hmm? So we have to look at this. Uh, uh, the, the data, the data size is important. What you're actually doing, how often you s remove something, and you can get something out of it. Good. That's a data structure out of the collections module. There's a bunch of more of them. Uh, the next one actually is um, default dict. Who used default dict before? Default dict? Few people? Yeah. So default dict can be useful and for some cases it can be faster. Yeah. Um, I just would like to explain to you how default text works. Import uh, from collections slicer from collections module import import default dict. So use case is as follows. Um, I can, for instance, if I would like to say I have a string. Something like this. Yeah? And I would like to count how many characters. There are different ways of doing it. But you if you just say, I know only dictionaries, then one way would be using set default. So set default is interesting. Set default, uh, uh, if you have a dictionary, D, yeah, and I have a key and a value, I can access my dictionary value to the key. If I use a a key doesn't exist, I get a value, a key error. I can achieve the same thing which is set default thing. And if I say A, I get back the value, and the dictionary hasn't changed. If I say set default, and I use B and give it a default value, which if I don't default, it will be none, then I get back this value, and at the same time, it will be added to the dictionary. This can be useful. So this would, I uh, wouldn't say if the key is thi in there, do this. Otherwise, do something else and add it. It's a very common use case. That's why you have set default. And so now, let's come to my example here. So let's have a string, s that looks like this, and I would like to count how many letters are on the string. And one way would be to use uh, set default. So I say, okay, uh, my count dictionary is an empty dictionary, and I go through, and I say, uh, for character in S, uh, count set default. There's no automatic thing here. Set default, uh, character zero, and then the next step, now it's in there, I can say, uh, a dictionary count <coughs> character plus I plus one plus equals one. Yeah. So okay. And now if I look at my count, I have something like this, and I get so the space is also a character, and I get my characters here counted. Now the, the notebook decides to display it like this, uh, and actually, in reality. The orders on the right because the notebook stores a dictionary, by the way. And <laughs> in reality, it, this is the order that is. That's just a bit different, as you see the last one. Because it's insertion order, this is a alphabetical because it's sorted. But it doesn't really matter. Right now, um, you can achieve the same thing with a default dict, because, and the default dict makes your code a bit shorter. Now, this is a good example, because uh, you I can save uh, one line. And here, I wouldn't. Uh, I can take something like this, and I can say <coughs> default dict, 
and this would be a default dict, and you have to you have to give it a function that it can call. Actually, dict is not a function; it's an instance, but it behaves like a function. And now you can use this directly, so you don't have to set it to zero because why? Because um, what do you do? Yeah, int, not dict, int. Of course, because <laughs> when you call int, yeah, without anything, you get a zero. So if it cannot find the key, it will call this construction function, to so speak, the constructor of, of int, <coughs> and produce a new value, and produce a zero. And now, if you look at the count equals count def, uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. You have to achieve the same thing and you save the line, because that's what default dict is good for. You can give it some function that produces a new value if the key is not there. So essentially the same content as this de set default, uh, but you have one more import, but one less line of code. And of course now uh, we want to measure load. Uh, I think uh, my process was working very hard I killed this one I'll just get away heating the room here okay load um, set default default dict when I compare both again when I again I write a small helper that's doing exactly what I did here at uh, <laughs> my two functions and um, these are the two functions I have here and in this case, I don't use anything, any table. I just use um, here um, time it directly. And I can say time it. Standard dict S. And I say time it default dict s and you can see uh, there are some difference it's a bit faster yeah. but l let's make the the makes the string a bit bigger a thousand times bigger and do the same thing do the same thing for bigger so there's always something you should consider when you do something use it with different sizes otherwise you might get not anything useful out of it so use with big S, which is a thousand times as long, yeah, and then see if there's a difference. But now I'm twice as fast. I'm twice as fast, and I saved the line of code. So in this case, I made it shorter. I used default dict. Default dict is okay because it's part of a standard library. You don't need a document because they read standard library. There's no need for me to explain anything. If you if you roll your own data structure, you need to explain what it's doing. You need to test it thoroughly. Here you have a well-tested, very high-performant thing in the standard library that makes it faster, and you can work with it. Good. This is about data structures. Just example. Of course, you have you might find totally different data structures for your use cases, uh, but you need to test it and again try to make some simple examples to understand and spend one or two hours to work with them, that might save you a few days work later with a more complex setup if you understand what you're actually doing. Yeah? This always art to get a simple enough example that still makes your case, <coughs> but it's not too simple that you don't have anything th 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 that's important for you. And that's not that clear, not that easy, but it's, uh, it's worthwhile to look at. Okay, um, let's look at this big O notation. I go quickly to my handout. We only have a few minutes left. So actually, we used this for a while here. This big O notation. This table here uh, hmm? is like this. Okay, just make it bigger. So we have it what's called the big O notation, which gives you the order of magnitude, how long things take. So typically the best one is O1. That means no matter what you do, it doesn't depend on the size of the structure. 
So finding the length of a list doesn't matter if the, the list has two elements or two million elements. It takes the same constant amount of time. The same thing for our membership test, element in set, element in dictionary. It's O1. doesn't matter if the dictionary has one element or a million. It takes the same amount of time. And that's typically the one you want to go for. O O1 is the best one in this case. The next one is ON, which is linear. So if, if this thing gets 10 times as big, it takes 10 times as long. So if, our if you look for N in a list which is not contained, you have to go through a whole list. The list is 10 times long, takes 10 times as long. Of course, you have to check for all of that, for instance. All those kind of looping things, typically it's linear. And then it gets nastier. Uh, N log N is slower. Typica the typical thing is search, a sort. If you sort something, it takes considerably longer than linear typically. Yeah. And the next one would be n squared, so it's a nested loop, a loop in another loop, a nested loop, then if you have hundred elements it takes ten thousand times as long. Oh. Yeah? Because the hundred times a hundred so you have ten thousand times ten thousand steps. So it's pretty and then everything higher than this uh, then you have nested nested uh, loops here and factorial this means uh, n is a power of something and it's like traveling salesman this is something that's very very quickly explodes and gets so long that it takes for air forever literally forever yeah this is just a very rough measurement typically there's also a factor in front of them but the factors very neglected so o one is not uh, o n is not always the same as o n this is just a uh, big thing but it gives you a very rough estimate how long it's going to take and of course, if the data structure is small, there's no big difference. The bigger it is, the more bigger the difference. So you always need to test with data structures with sizes that are useful for your own uh, purposes. Good. I think the next example is just very quickly. We, we had this already, so that's why we don't have to spend so much time, because we did this exercise. Mm. Oh, it's not the file name, what's the file name? No, oh, I didn't write the file name. Check myself. Yeah, insert. Okay, this is our sample from the exercise. So uh, this one is um, insert zero one, and this is the one that append the reverse. So here's one more line. So with the paper is one more line, but now we can compare both of them for different sizes. Again, I uh, have this one, and of course th the most useful one would be just take the iterable and re use reverse and convert it to a list if you want the list at the end, and then uh, run these ones against each other and compare. Runtimes, okay, yeah. And again, it's probably better to run from the command line, and I create a table again with some stuff to to compare. Then you can see the ratios, how they behave, and what they do. Good. Again, you see, it it's useful to create some kind of tables. At least I, I like some tables because then, the if you want to, you can have more use cases. And if I had more use cases, then just run it overnight and see next day what's coming out to get some feeling out of it. It might take a while because if you have so many use cases, of course, the time may explode. Uh, the other thing is they're all independent. You can run them in parallel. You have a lot of processors. You can add a little bit help to have them run in parallel and keep your CPU really busy because you use all the cores. And of course. They are independent. Every run is independent from the others. So you can parallelize it easily using multiprocessing or something, or using just starting several scripts with different parameters at the same time. That would be fine. Yeah. Then of course, it wouldn't be that easy to put in one table. You have to put it together at the end. But huh? and, and see now, if they're getting bigger, their results um, start to the, the ratio is getting bigger. And bigger. And factor 300, this is something that's not. And I think I have to cancel this one here. <coughs> okay, so 
can interrupt this same as control C and then we can stop this one and we can run from the command line to see the differences. Okay, these are some data structures. I have one last topic, of course we only have 10 minutes left, so quickly, just the last topic, uh, another technology to get things faster, which can be useful, this would be caching. Caching, caching is it's a big field and is used in many different places, and typically when you have something that's deterministic, so if you put the same thing in and you something in, you get always the same result, a deterministic function, then you can use caching. If the result is very random, always the same, I don't think any use case for caching. <laughs> Uh, it has to be something deterministic. And therefore, let's look at some examples. And I have two. Uh, cached. And it's a very, very, very simple and s simplified uh, versions here. They just give you a, a feeling. So if you want to do caching, you will see that even Python standard library has a way more sophisticated caching thing than I have here, and you find ex external libraries that do caching. But just the principle. There are different ways of doing it. Typically, a decorator is a good thing for caching, because you want to have a function, and you want to modify the function, and put some additional functionalities, and the decorator is good. So I use, again, a dictionary, which is a common thing to use caches. Then I have this three-level decorator, which gets here a function that produces a key. We have to load this key function first. Get key. This is a small helper. So you need to actually calculate the signature of the function called in the different ways of doing this. Here I get a function, I get all arguments and keyword arguments, and I just generate a string which has the, f the module name and the function name, and in addition I have, I take this arguments, the keyword arguments apart, and generate a unique signature for a function name plus positional keyword arguments. Yeah? And this is, it's important that you can distinguish this function calls. And then I just, the cache is very easy. I just generate this key. If I have this key in my cache already, I just return a result. Otherwise, I call my function, calculate the value, and put the key in a dictionary. That's the principle of a cache. <coughs> that can be way more sophisticated. That would be fine. And then I do my game here. Uh, since I have three devs, I need to have three returns. So when you are a decorator, you have three devs nested, and you have three returns nested. Yeah. And now I have my memoized here, or my memoized uh, deterministic, and I can use it. And I can have a function, something like add a and b. And I uh, say print adding return a plus b. So normal functionality a plus b add two and three is five. Uh, yeah, so I have to specify, I have to put the parentheses because it's three level, forgotten the parentheses. And I use a normal key function, I don't specify a different function. You see, if I call this one now, I get. Uh, the next time there's no adding anymore, I get the 5, but it only recomputed. For this simple function, a plus b, caching doesn't make any sense, because the calculating of a key takes way more time than 2 plus 3. Yeah. So it has to be a function that has substantial, takes a while, whatever a while is, you have to, it has to make sense. So it's something very, very simple, it doesn't make sense to do cache. It's easier to recalculate the value over time because you're faster than doing this extra thing. But if something that takes half a second, of course, uh, that's a that makes it much faster. Yeah? Uh, it has a sm small signature, say add 2 and b <coughs> is 3. It's a different signature because I don't distinguish, I don't f figure out that b is the same thing as positional and the keyboard. So th that will be a different signature. But there are not so many combinations. The next time we will be there. So this has quite a few dis disadvantages um, because there's no expiration. Of course, I can go into cache and it always clear the cache. I can explicitly go in the dictionary, delete something with dictionary if you wanted to, manually to some degree. Uh, that's why, but you can also make it automatically. So you can have a non-deterministic cache. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
as a function name. Cache, yeah, load cache, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and here the only thing I changed, I give it a, gave it an age. No, I can give it an age, and if something has been there for too long, it will be removed from the cache. So I just get a timestamp, and I check the next time if it's too long, whatever is in seconds here in case, I will remove it from the cache. So that's one way of doing it. It's one way of doing it, and I just here see now as the, the key now is a, is a it's a tuple with a value with, a, with the original key plus this this age, and if then one is expired, it will be deleted, and I will recalculate. And there's a deprecation here, and then make this. So it gets a bit more complicated, but it will be deleted automatically. This would be this one. As I said, uh, in Python, you Python 3, you have the least recently used cache, and you can also actually have it as a backport for Python 2 if you really want it. We're going to work with Python 2. So I say from func tools, from func tools, import LRU cache, and you get a much nicer cache. And I type import, it's import. And this one, it gives you so-called least recently used cache, um, and it works exactly the same. So you can specify a max size. If you don't have one, it will be unlimited. But you can have so okay, it should be have so many elements. And as soon as the size is expired, that everything hasn't been used, uh, has been uh, hasn't been used for a while, will be thrown out, and only the one that has been used most recently will be keep in there. Yeah, and type means so this one. If if this falls, then a, a, a one. As an integer, 1.0 as a float will be the same, otherwise it will be treated differently. So this is a very sophisticated one. It's probably much faster than you can write. And if you use it, you use it as a decorator, and you say, so I use my function here, and instead of using my own decorator, I use least recently used. Yeah? And I can say memory LRU. And I can specify a max size uh, of three, yeah. And then I can look at add, and add now goes this uh, info. And when I call it, you see now it gives me information max size, and there are some other things about how many hits, misses, and so on are there. And um <coughs> I can also clear this thing, and I can say add two and three. And then if you look at course we would call it and if you look at this uh, info now I had one miss because it hasn't been there yeah and the size is now one if I call this again with two and three and I look at info I can then see it change yeah so it's more sophisticated than I have and potentially much faster also and takes care of all the corner cases and they keep going now and if I don't use it it will be Deleted and will be recomputed after a while. Yeah. So least recent use is pretty useful, and you have a cache and that can improve your performance depending on the use case. Good. So exactly, time is up. We made it. We had to go a little bit faster at the end. Uh, some sprint. There's a big table of some tools which we don't cover here anyway. But if you want to have a look. This was just a very short introduction in the world of making things faster. Uh, take home messages, you have to measure. And don't trust all measurements blindly. Remeasure, try something else. Use some tools, but also tools make mistakes. There are a lot of tools. If something is strange, try it a different way, try another way, and if they all agree, you might be right. If not, you're wrong, and you have to do something else. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Again, go to the link for the evaluation. I showed you in the in the slides here. This is supposed to be the link. It is also in the in the, in the upload and yeah, up here. Uh, don't forget. Go to the link. I will be here for the whole conference and for the sprint. So if you want to talk to me, you just can grab me out of the hallway. And if you have any questions about these kind of things, I will be glad to talk to you. Thank you very much and have a nice conference. <laughs>